What's up, everyone? I'm Evan B. Stone, Music Cube. I'm a world-class adventurer and cinematographer. Basically, I go around the world and capture the adventure of travel. and really extreme stuff. The is terrible in here. You okay? Really intense. Like diving. That's a plane, unbelievable. Climbing. The whole wall is literally just disintegrating. Back up, back up, back up. Back up. Anything that feels a little dangerous. That goes all the way down to the ocean level. Yes, almost 200 feet. It's opening up into a chamber. The viewer wants to be in the action. And that's what I give them. This is the definition of madness. Are you kidding me? These remote locations can be breathtakingly beautiful, but also just as deadly. Here we go. Hey, hey, hey. Just found a landmine back there. One more down, four or five million to go. Fire now. Anything can happen in these remote and exotic locations. And sometimes they do. Look over there on the other side. Wait, 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 hey! What I've learned in this business is keep shooting no matter what. How are you? Oh, uh, I... Nice to meet you. What's your name? Uh, Bill. Bill? Yes. You don't look like a Bill. <laughs> that was a little touch and go there for a minute. This is what travel is all about. And capturing that essence is my job. This is the craziest welcome I've ever seen. I mean, I assume it's a welcome. I could be murdered in the next 10 minutes. I don't know. <laughs> Live from New York City, La Ciudad de Nueva York. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. Get ready. You're ready. I'm ready. We're ready. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles live, sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush Chain, Reaction Records and Skateboards, Your Core Hardcore Fan Page, DTFM, Vinyl Distro, and, of course, our friends in Corpus Christi, Texas. Chacho's Tacos. Great show today. My brother Evan B. Stone's coming on. We're going to talk about a lot of cool stuff. Ghosts, Bigfoot, hardcore music, all that good stuff. What's happening? What is happening? Yo, Alan Dubin, what's up? Family, blood, here you go. Sander, good to see you, man. What's up, Chucky? Sid the Kid, everybody. What's up, Lenny? It's Wednesday. Is it hump day? Who's humping? Who's out there humping? Yo, Debo, what's up, bro? Hey, Gina. Laura Zeitlin, out there on the, on the Jersey Shore, on the Jersey Shore. What's happening? Yo, Bob Riley, what's up, bro? Troy, Troy, New York, represent. We've met the enemy, and the enemy is us. Troy, New York, John Sanchez, in search of spliff foot. Okay, spliff foot, there you go. Um, what else? What's happening in Arizona? What's up, Larry Kelly? Everybody, everybody, what's up? It's a Wednesday show as we're, as we're heading out of the zombie apocalypse. The world is starting to open up. I'm feeling a little anxiety, you know? Are you all going to leave me when the, when the world opens up? Do people, are people still going to want to watch the show? What's going to happen? Are you going to cast me aside? Ah, the world's, the world's picked up again. I don't need Drew Stone and his silly show. Ah, God. 
Hey, John. What's up, bro? Yeah, shows are coming back soon. This is true. Okay, good. We'll watch the show as a group now. Okay. New York Hardcore forever. Hey, Whitney, haven't seen you in a minute. Welcome home. That said, you know what? Listen, the show's good. Sh Richard Hughes, what's up, man? Stranglehold represent. What's happening, Richard? It is. <laughs> Hope you're well, but Stranglehold, Boston represent. What's the, yo, Drew, what's the name of the antidote song in the intro? That is called Conspiracy of None. It is off the No Peace in Our Time antidote record. Let's quickly talk about a couple of upcoming shows. And then we will get crack a lacking. Coming up on Sunday, this Sunday, we have Mike Gitter, um, XXX fanzine journalist and A&R. Hey, Steven, you're going to have to redo this, this flyer because I think that YouTube is picking up the um, algorithm XXX and they think it's a porno thing. So they're not, so that I'm, I'm already having issues with this. So you might have to get XXX off the flyer. Um, so uh, then um, there will be no Wednesday show a week from today, uh, following up with the return of Jimmy G. Uh, then we have a week from then we got John John Jesse from Nausea, and then one of the old school Boston hardcore guys, Al Burrell from SSD Control. Super excited about that. Took a while to get him. Yep, man. We got Al Burrell. We got John John. We got Jimmy G. We got Gitter. It's all going down. Get your get your last licks in before before you're all back out on the street again. You know. So Al will have his say. Abs absolutely. The kids will have their say. The kids will rise someday. That said, let's bring on the hardcore shutterbug. Where is the hardcore shutterbug? Oh, there he is. Hey, where he is? Where is he? Here I am. Here I am. Oh, I'm in, I'm in the box. Oh, there you are. Do I, I know there. you? Do no, I know you? No, but there you are. Wherever I am. You know that scene in Austin Powers when he's walking through the casino and he goes to the guy, oh, hey, there you are. And the guy goes, do I know you? And he goes, no, but there you are. <laughs> <laughs> What's going oh, on, man. man? Oh, it's nice. I, I could, I'm back in the box again. It's, it's, warmer, it's warm enough that I could be in here and comfortably not freezing to death. But, Did you, uh, tell me that, you tell me that some, gra some graffiti train just pulled yeah. into the station? Right as we were doing the pre-show a seven train right next door came rolling in. The whole train is covered. Yo, you so, hear that? You hear that? RS seventy UGHC. A whole a whole seven train just pulled into the yard, totally graffitied from head to toe. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna take a run over there after I do my segment and see if I can get some visual evidence. And I'll be back. Yeah, get photos, man. But hey, uh, let's, let's jump let's right into picture of the day. Yeah. Hey, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, wrong answers only, please. This is Stephen Messina, Hardcore Shutterbug, picture of the day. Boom. Well, damn, whoever he is, he's skinny, that's for sure. He could use a sandwich, that guy. Hey, have a sandwich. <laughs> what a sandwich. All right. Let's see. Porn? <laughs> Whoa. Is it Kiss? Huh. Oh, so that's what Gene Simmons looks like under the makeup. <laughs> right? Is it Jimi Hendrix? Well, kind of close. <laughs> right? Oh, good one, Chucky. Is it Chris Fist? Good, good one. Um, what else? Is it is it Samuel L. Jackson? Is it Orgy? <laughs> Oh jeez. Is it vid is it vid -sicious? Is it the porn star Evan Stone? Good one. <laughs> We're gonna get into that. We're gonna get into that because that shit is funny. We're not showing that. any of that footage, are we? Is it is it is it Sammy Davis Jr.? Is it Phil Linet? Is it Flan Vicious? Is it I need a meal? 
<laughs> he needs is some it flying. Celtic? Is it Celtic Frost? Oh, here's a winner. Is it Danny Wilker? <laughs> That's good. Good. Is it? Is it Fieldy? Angelo Moore picks up the base. All right. Is it Lenny Kravitz? You know, not real funny. Is it Teenage Joe Pesci? Kind of funny. Huh. All right. Is it Biohazard? That's definitely Evan Seinfeld. It's Evan Seinfeld. <laughs> it, it, it's, he's lost a lot of weight, you know. There you go. Good one, Ray. Is it TM Stevens out of control? Kind of funny. Is it the Foreskins, of course? All right. Is it every SoundCloud rapper ever? Is it, is it Kronos? Okay. <laughs> All right. Give me some right answers. All right. How about some right answers? You know, is it, is it King's X? Yeah. Is it King's X? Is it Doug Pinnock? Yeah. All right. We got people in the know here. I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. It is, it is King's X. And this is 1992 at a place called Sparks in Deer Park, Long Island. Oh, wow. And yeah. uh, in fact, the, the, this was a pretty interesting, a little hardcore tie-in for you here. The opening act was a band called Mind Funk. And Mind, Mind Funk was, um, my, was it, wait, Mind Funk was the guy from, um, not, not um, Into Another. That, no, the Mind Funk was, um, I got it, was... Um, I, I got uh, the California band, right? No. Um, the uh, wasn't it Uniform Choice? Yeah, Uniform Choice. Yes, yeah. yes, right. Yes, right. as well as a guy Pat, named. Yeah, thank you, Bob Riley. Pat Dubar. Yes, yes, yes. With long hair, it was Pat Dubar with yeah. long hair. Oh yeah, Uniform they were great. Their choice. first record was great too. The um, and uh, King's X. Uh, and I think in Mind Funk, I think what's his name? Um, John Monty. Mon John Monty. Yeah. From from MOD was in Mind. Yeah. Yep. Right. In fact, yeah. uh, it's it's funny. Because oh, and Reed St. Mark. Okay. Sure. Also, um, yo, yo, Astoria Lou, what's up? <laughs> so uh, there you go. Yeah, that was a band that a lot of people came and went, like Jason Everman. Uh, was was in Mind Funk uh, for like the, the second album, I believe, after leaving uh, Soundgarden. You right. know, and uh, a lot of a lot of people came and went through there. But King's X, on the other hand, still going strong to this day. Uh, still the same three guys. Just a tremendous band. Uh, heavy. They're like a musician's band. Like most, like band guys love this band. They they're were heavy, great, but they're Beatles esque. But they're like grungy. They're I've seen Alice in Chains open up for them. Like we were just talking about it, the limelight. Like they they're just a just a killer band and there's and they've been around playing together since like the early 70s. I did um I produced a video for them, uh yes. Dog Man. I produced the Dog Excellent. Man video. Excellent it was directed record. it was directed by Paris Mayhew, uh of the Crow Mags fame. And uh I worked with them and yeah, where's my where's my King's yo? Know, where's my King's X photo in, in let me go to the archives. Hold on. Yeah. Hold yeah, on. These... Let, me, let, me, let me get rid of this one thing at a time. Ah. One thing at a time. Let me find that King's X. King's X, King's X, King's X. Yeah, he's, he's yeah. going to be he's gonna be 71 years old this year. Jeez. Yeah, he's uh, – and, and I think he weighs about 30 pounds. I can't seem to find it. King, I got, I got Generation X. Yeah. What happened to the great King's X, King's X shot I had? Huh. That's a bummer. That dog, that dog man record is great too. I remember, I remember the. Uh, me, I'm not, yeah. Yeah. It was great. Oh, Working yeah. with them was great. They're really, really nice bunch of guys. You know. Yeah, they. I, I just they're they're like a super underrated band, and they appeal to really all kinds of music, which is cool. Like they're not. They're not, they don't just do the same thing over and over again. So, yeah. But uh, I remember that you had, a, you know, you had done the video and everything. And uh, it just, uh, some reason that one popped in my head today. So I figured I'd send it along. I'm bummed you know? I can't find my great King's X photo. I wonder what happened to that. This is unacceptable. 
All right. Do you have everything alphabetical and chronological? Well, listen, that's what I do when I'm like, you know, sitting on an air uh, on a on a flight, you know. I like go into the archive and label everything. All right. That said, cool. Go out and get some pictures of us for the, of that graffiti train, will you? I'm on the case. I'll see you in a bit. <laughs> Hail death to false metal. That's it. <laughs> All right. I'll see you in a bit. Later. Well, there you go. That was Stephen Messina of the Hardcore Shutterbug. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, and we are sponsored by DTFM, Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, Your Core Hardcore Fan Page, New York Hardcore Comics, and the Texas Silver Rush. The Texas Silver Rush is a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in work with musicians in all genres to design and create unique one-off pieces, as well as to style them for stage, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famers Greg Rollet, Agnostic Ringo Starr, you gotta sing the blues. You gotta pay your dues if you wanna sing the blues. And you know it don't come easy. Yo, for you, Bob Riley, for you, brother, up in Troy, New York, every time I see your face, it reminds me of the things we used to do. Yeah, brother. During this current pandemic, all information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram page. And of course, www.thetexassilverrush.com. While we're at it, New York Hardcore Comics opened back in 2013 when lifelong friends Devoted Pro and Lee Fairley combined their collections and obsessions for comic books, punk rock, toys, statues, magic, the gathering, and all things horror. The store is located at 117 Main Street in lovely Dobbs Ferry, New York. If you want to support them during this pandemic, please contact them via email at newyorkhardcorecomics at gmail.com. That said, I'm ready. You're ready. We're ready. It is that Rambo. time Rambo. everyone Rambo. 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 bro what up what up <laughs> how you doing you know your intro is like 10 times louder than anything we do on the show i i want an intro like that Honestly. I wish I had an intro like that. Hey, you know, you got to put in the work, you know? Yep. Good things come to those who do good things. Hey, do bad things and bad things will happen to you. Hey, you know, sometimes, you know, I say it's chance, you know, too, a little bit. All right. Tell yourself, what, you I'm know. Not, I, I, I've been Jones in the show, like a lot of stuff. But I like keeping it simple. You know, I show the things I collect. And I haven't been showing the Conan comic. And I want to say, I think a lot of kids should really read Conan, you know? <laughs> Just because, like, by, by page three of this book, he's already, like, fought off a horde of pigs, fought a snake, fought a saber-toothed tiger, a panther, a jaguar, killed them all. Come on. Grow up. But Conan the Barbarian Savage Sword, issue number 27, is a bad who's, the dude, who's like the, the artist that's most associated it's, with Conan? Is that Sal, Sal Bushima? He's one. It's John Bushima. Oh, John Bushima. That's that's Look. my dude right there. Yes, dude. Look at this. Look at this. This is the first page. Yeah, that's the dude. That's him. A bunch of cavemen coming up a cliff, you know? Yo, look yeah. at the dude at the bottom, man. That's hard. Awesome, dude. Yeah, that's hard, man. Yeah. John Bushima. And, 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 and script by Roy Thomas. Absolutely, yeah. bro. And uh, adapted, of course, from Robert E. Howard. But yep. yeah, I mean, you know, second page, he's fighting off a snake, a saber-toothed tiger. Another right. page, he's fighting a jaguar. In the, you know, he's awesome. Way, way tougher than Tarzan, you know? What was the other one, uh, Robert? Uh, there was Conan, Tarzan, and there was uh, John Carter from Mars. Yes, yeah. Did you see that John movie? Carter. No, I saw the movie. It was, uh, You know what I didn't like about that movie that ruined it for me? It's, it yeah, the gravity thing right there when he couldn't walk and he had to bounce around. But those, yeah, yeah those were great paperbacks growing up. And uh, 
I also want to show a couple magazines real quick, even though they're Star Wars topic. I used to love these magazines. Starburst. These were kind of like knockoffs of the head magazine I'm going to show real quick. You got Starburst, Fantastic Films. You know, I was obsessed with this stuff when I was a kid. You know, some kids got baseball cards. I wanted to have a stack of magazines in my room, you know? This is the official collector's edition of The Empire Strikes Back. Probably sells for like 20 bucks, you know? And then this is like a French magazine. It's just got all the basic, you know, stuff. But I really used to dig these. These were what I really used to geek out on. The Star Logs. And that is, uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, Christopher Lloyd? Oh, or yeah, what? Christopher Lloyd. He, he, he was in uh, Back to the Future. Yeah. You know, these are just nerd trips, you know? He's also in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah, he's he's like in everything. He's oh, one gee. Of the yeah, you got uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. All right. Star Log. I used to geek out on the Star Logs. I always got a pile of these around. What else? Uh, and uh, then let's move it over to the toy. And, you know, everybody's always talking about these days. They're talking about this guy all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Talking about Baby Yoda. But I got this cool bootleg. And it's funny because I sold this to some friends in a group of toys. I sold it to my buddies. And it sat in this guy's store for like a year. So I just wound up buying it back. But this is like a little cool uh it's like a wax plastic you know baby you know yoda they just took the action figure made the mold so he's pretty dope okay and that kind of bridges into i always like to show like the new stuff i'm always getting because i'm in the flea markets every weekend and this weekend i got these really cool i love smalls because you can you know you don't have to the storage is nuts but i got some of these awesome little green soldier guys they're like that waxy plastic too you can see the plastic has like a wax sheen on it that's how you can kind of date it from the 60s and early 70s and uh then i got these guys too all in the same box i bought the whole box for like the guy wanted like 30 bucks i think i talked him down to like 15 bucks you know but these guys are dope too same that wax Oh, dude on a stretcher. Guy on the stretcher, that's, right? That's cancel culture right there, bro. Yeah, but that's just dope, right? <laughs> and and it's funny because you know, you find the stuff in a in a mixed box with everything else in it. So if you don't dig down in the corners of the box, I would have missed the stretcher. It wouldn't have been complete, you know. So I really I I go all in. And I just want to show a couple more because these are really Hurry cool. up, man. I gotta get my brother on the friggin' show. Right. Yeah, Yo, you want to talk cancel culture. What's that? Maybe. I can't see. What is it? You know, he came with a guy on a ship looking like, you know. Ah. Oh. Hey, be careful, bro. They'll come, they'll come to your house like. Yeah, I love like this I guy. This guy is my AF guy. See, he's got the gas mask on. <laughs> got it. So, yeah, he's cool as shit, too. And then the last one, last one, I know it's a lot. I love, and I always you only find these like one at a time. I'll never find a full box of these, but this guy's pretty cool too, man. Spartacus. Oh, right on. You know, it's a so, man. yeah. Hello, listen, boys. That's a, that's all, a Robin. It's a Robin, uh, a Centurion. All cancel culture, and I just want to explain one more thing about little green soldiers, little green, the little green army soldiers. There's two kind out there. See this guy here. See the helmet. Mm -hmm. It's like a waffle pattern, you know? So, like, he's like, you, you can kind of date the era, you know? Got it. Of right. what year they were put out or whatever, you know? Those little green army men are classic from the 70s, you know? The stuff we had, uh, the guns in Navarone is the big place that, like, I'm always on the hunt for the guns of Navarone place. That was, a dope, that was a dope movie. Yeah. And then there was Force 10 from Navarone that was the sequel, you know? Nice. Yeah. Well, All right, bro. Let me, let me get popping. I got to get my brother on. Parks was a big part of my childhood. So, like, I always am digging around looking for that stuff. And, uh, you know, that's what I do. It's what, uh, it's my zen. How I rock garden. I dig to you in a bit. You guys have a good one. I want to come on and talk to your brother later. Yeah.
Check you guys out in a minute. All right. Rat bones! Rat bones! Rat bones! Rat bones! Rat bones! Rat bones! Well, there you go. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. And we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, the Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, and of course, Your Core Hardcore Fan Page. In the wake of the pandemic, Your Core Chris created Your Core Fan Page, utilizing lessons learned from over 20 years of being an educator and social worker. He decided to try to reach a hardcore punk in the surrounding genre of bands, create not only their music, but their message. The interviews are from a psychological perspective to harvest motivation, personal insight, and perspective. Please reach out to them on Facebook or Instagram if you have content to share, even if your band friggin' sucks or you want to promote your band, even if it sucks, your core fan page. I'm just kidding. Everybody's band is great. There's always something about any band that's kind of okay. That said, let's clear the deck. What the heck? Let's bring on today's guest. Here we go. Make sure he's ready over there. Back there, let me make sure I'm, I'm okay. My hair is right and everything. I want to. I want to. I want to. Um, I want to say hi to uh, a lot of people out there. They're probably tuning into the show for the first time because my brother is on it. A lot of our our, our family members and friends who really have no business watching a show like this, unless my brother or someone like that's on, but. Welcome, everybody. Let's have some fun. Here we go. Today's guest is an American film director, editor, and cinematographer hailing from New York City. As a cinematographer, he's known for his work on Naked and Afraid, Finding Bigfoot, Ghost Nation, and of course, Discovery Channel's Expedition Unknown. He's had a proficient career directing numerous music videos and extreme sports films, including the, hosts, the Hoax series, Coming at Us. From Huntington Beach, California, my brother of the same mother, Mr. Evan B. Stone. Wow, what's up? Oh, yo. What's happening? All right. Thanks for having me on. Let's let's get right into it. Let's get into it, bro. Yep. Yep. Um, what's going on? Um, when 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 this whole thing hit, what happened? I know you were you were you've been working with Josh Gates and Expedition I know for a couple years. Like, how did this affect the show? What's going on? Uh, I was actually on a show called Ghost Nation uh, when it went down, the pandemic. And we stayed a little bit, and then we went home. <clears throat> and then I just kept busy. I did uh, two documentaries, one of them finishing documentary with uh, our dad, Arnie, uh, called Jews in the Blues. But also I went on the road and did a full documentary about families, um, how they're dealing with COVID. And it was month one. I went across the country in a camper van, and we're posting that right now as well. And now I'm getting back on the road with Expedition Unknown in about a week and uh, two, uh, three weeks, but uh, more adventure. Yeah, so uh, you know what? It's a great time to work on your personal projects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if you didn't, well, you lose, you know. <laughs> yeah, for, for sure. How, how long, how many years have you been working on Expedition Unknown now? Well, the, before it was Destination Truth on, on Sci-Fi, uh, same kind of show, but about seven years now with Expedition Unknown. I've been working with Josh Gates about 12 years, so I'm known as a premier adventure filmmaker in the world, uh, and uh, they keep me busy and doing crazy things. Like this. On top of El Tigre, which is the tallest pyramid in Central America, and it's man-made. This is the view. Beautiful. It's super steep. Check it. These stones right here, all of this stuff here, Every one of these rocks have been brought up from way down there. There's actually other pyramids here as well. There's a pyramid there. There's a pyramid there. There's a really big pyramid over here. Really amazing. This whole valley, no humans. Just monkeys and panthers and stuff. <laughs> Nice, nice golden light. Yeah, I mean, we're on top of the arguably the largest pyramid in the world. No one knows about it. It's in Guatemala. Um, and it's in a caldera, it's in a big, uh, calderas and it's a, no one can get to it uh, unless you're with helicopter and for good reason. They don't want to put roads in there because then all the bad guys come and start digging up stuff. And, <clears throat> um, and, um, it's called El Mirador 
and, and that, that predates the Mayan stuff, right? That's right. It's called pre-Mayan. It's a thousand years before what we know as Mayans. It was this wow. other culture, and they had a city as big as Los Angeles that is now covered in jungle. And no one knows. You'd have to. What we do is we use a, a thing called lidar, which is uh, it strips away in a plane. It strips away all the the vegetation, what sees underneath, and there's roads crisscrossing. And if you've seen that movie, um, El Apocalypto, it's about this. Per particular culture. Oh, is that uh, right? Yeah. And you notice in the beginning, um, they're, they're, if you notice when they're marching the, him into the, as a slave, uh, people are, have this white powder. Yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah. And that's all called lie. And um, what they, they were really into painting everything white. It was this gilded white. It's like 2000 years ago. This is crazy. Anyway, they cut down all the green trees because they needed it really hot to, to create this lie. And then all this lie kind of seeped into the, um, ground and they couldn't grow everything anymore and i asked the, the lead archaeologist what what happened because it was it in a in that kind of time period it was very modern so to speak and he said conspicuous consumption ruined them which is kind of like what we're doing you know <laughs> just just whatever we we want white you know like yeah so uh, it's really cool um it's the biggest um area where there's jaguars um, and you have to fly in by a helicopter to get there. Uh, no one really goes there, and uh, it's a really precious place. Uh, they have these snake kings. The, the kings are called, uh, and they're, they're, it's kind of right out of like Conan, <laughs> really, truth <laughs> be told. You talk about Conan's savage sword. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much like that. But Conan lived in Kush, you know. Hey, I got another one, and this this one's really this one's really intense, man. Uh, let's take a look at this one here. Seven. Right now, I'm on the Dotlov Pass in Siberia, Russia. This is one of the biggest mysteries in Russia. On this pass, right over here, where we're going, seven hikers died mysteriously, and right now it's thirty below. And uh, we're gonna reconstruct what happened and see if we can figure it out. Yo, Siberia looks hard, yo. <laughs> oh yeah. <clears throat> so, so let me let me. Let me throw out what, what I think I know about this situation, because I, I know a little bit about it, right? Yep. Apparently, in, th in this part of Siberia, seven hikers, seven hikers went out there, and something happened, and they all were, like, um, they were all, uh, like, killed, but also sort of maimed in really bizarre circumstances, and- yep. One, they were found sort of naked, running in a weird like this one in that direction, and the, the, the and, and there's just, am I sort of right about that? Yeah, yeah. There was uh, very accomplished hikers. It was kind of like Eagle Scouts back in the day, and back in Russia in the '60s, the the to to get this certificate was a huge deal. Um, you know how Russians get, you know, when they get into something, it's all out um, and they got to be the best. And so these were very experienced hikers. They went to the most remote part of the Ural Mountains and it was minus 50 degrees to, to hit this pass. Right. Uh, and and they came up missing. And this is Russia's one of Russia's biggest mysteries. It's like the Kennedy assassination assassination. It's like what happened. Right. Um and speculations go from, you know, aliens to military to uh, it, it. You just the more you know about the story, the more you're like, wait, what and how? I mean, they're they ripped themselves out of the tent from the inside. Uh, they were wearing each other's clothing and barefoot. Uh, this this footprint. Yeah, one of them, them ran out barefoot into the snow, right? Yeah, and his, his footprints of them at the edge of the of the um, of the forest, looking back. Um, and but also, you know. There's a couple of theories. Um, National Geographic just came out with a really big uh, news that they figured it out. They say it was an avalanche. We did avalanche testing there, and it was it didn't seem to be steep enough. Um, if you speak to the locals, they'll say that it was uh, military um, bad guys came and were like caught out there, and they they get out with the 
AKs. And this is our tent now, you know. Uh, another thing that is possible is there's military testing on that um, pass, and it could be cluster bombs. Like they've thrown up cluster bombs just to test them. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Imagine that 20 feet above there. Uh -huh, you uh -huh. wake up in the middle, it's like, ka, ka, ka. It's, you know, and just running out. Um, there's another theory um, that it's an audio anomaly that reverberates in, in cold weather off mountains and creates this kind of like a, you know, one of those like weapons, you know, those like uh, low audio weapons. Um, but still no one really knows. And um, it's really crazy. Now, here's, uh, a, here's a shot of you and Josh, right? I mean, you've been all over the world with this dude. That's right. Yeah. Um, right there, we're in Turkey about to dive in the, for some monster, lake monster, <laughs> Van Lake. Um, but uh, yeah, man, he's my best friend. You know, we travel around, we do TV shows. Um, he's, he's, you know, oh, what a creative maverick, this guy, you know, and uh, he trusts me with his show. And we're like, we have fun. You know, we go out there and we just laugh and I'm into ghost hunting. I'm into Bigfoot stuff. You know, even though I'm, we're from the Upper East Side of New York City, <laughs> it's really cool. And you know what? It's fun to, it's fun to go with it and just to be like, sure, you know, like, and how does it work? And where's Bigfoot? How does he, okay, let's go look for him. Everyone wants to know, everyone wants to believe there's something else out there that is unexplainable. And I think that's why these shows do so well. And that's why our show does well. Hey, um, I got to shout out our friend Hoya from Madball. Because yeah, you and me back in the day, right? You shot. You were behind the camera for that first Madball video that we yeah. did down by law. Remember that? Yeah. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's right. right, Hoya. My Hoya, friend, what's up? Yo, and also, I mean, also got to shout out. Ori Frank, yo, 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 cheers from Tel Aviv, dear brothers. L'chaim. What up? Boy, yeah. right there, man. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it love, is. Love that, dude. Um, let me see. What, what else? I, you sent me a bunch of pictures. Mm -hmm. um, let me find a couple of those. Yeah, most most people want to know about the time I got blown away by a ghost in the Halabuchu Forest in Romania. Is that um, this? Wait, hold on. Is that this? Is that this? Oh, uh, yeah. That's, I still have those scars on my arm. It was pretty much my first outing with Destination Truth with Josh Gates. And we went to this Romanian forest where nothing grows in this perfect circle. And it's been steeped in lore that, you know, um, lights, magical lights happen there, even back in the medieval days. And, and Romania is like really like Transylvania. It's really <laughs> backwards. And, and you could almost imagine like dark magic and stuff. And they say in World War II, this forest um ha was occupied by the nazis and they were doing some testing so it's really you know we went to this place and um we did something called a haunting where each each person goes into the middle of the uh and and we have ir cameras and back at base camp josh and the crew watches it and they check in with us how's it going everyone what's going on and i'm i was didn't know anything about this stuff and i was um <laughs> yeah and then i was sitting there about 20 minutes cross led and all of a sudden this wind came just felt like it felt like I was having an acid flashback. It was like the the the, the foreground and the floor was going different ways, and then I was just like, "Oh, what's going on?" And then this wind came, wah! And then I just don't remember anything. I got um, twenty minutes later, they found me in the woods, totally disorientated, um, and I had this itchy feeling on my arms, and I rolled up my sleeves and. Yeah, it's like claw marks or something. And then I freaked out. I was like, I want to go home. <laughs> like, all the way, all the way home. All the way. Um, I'm done. It turned out to be the the number one rated show of the season. And I was on camera. I've been on camera a lot more since. They actually, <laughs> the next season they wanted, they asked the audience what they wanted. And they said, Evan, back in the forest. So <laughs> I went back in the forest as actual talent, not as a cameraman. And let me tell you something, that's an easy job. If you're just talent and doing being yourself, I was like, oh man, this is fun, you know? But uh, it's a spooky place. And I think things like that, you have to accept, you have to be open for it. Your doors of perception have to be open. And then it comes at you. Um, and it does come to me often. I get to like block it out a lot. But uh, um, that was really cool. It was spooky too. And that's the same trip we went to. Um, after that, we went to um, Chernobyl. 
we went to and we did Ghosts of Chernobyl and um that was we were there really early we were there in what 90 in 2009 I think um and you remember it happened in 88 I think so it wasn't that much further and there's some pictures from my trip um man this place is like out of a movie set I mean everyone just walked away and the you walk in these I had a level four radiation suit on I didn't take it off I had a dosimeter on my camera bip, 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 bip. and um the, the, you see the the um ferris wheel area that actually is really radiated uh, radiation really attaches to rubber um and so anything rubber you bip, 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 you walk in I was like oh I'm good I'll use my lens you know yeah. it was super spooky and it was cold and they buried a lot of people right in this courtyard there and I had this oh man this spooky feeling um yeah. Did you see this? this uh, Chris Hoffman just said the babushkas. You see that documentary, the babushkas of Chernobyl? No, no. But truth no, be told, I, yeah, I, I, I've seen it. It's a whole bunch of these women right. that they that went like climbed the fence and went back to their homes, and they live there in yep. in, in, in Chernobyl. They they you know and and a lot of them they they sort of have this little community, and they they went back. It's the only home they knew. Yeah. So they, they climbed the fence or, or, or got under the fence and they're like living in their homes. It is, it's called the, it's called the babushkas of Chernobyl. I recommend it. It's a really interesting documentary. Yeah. The, there were, there were people living there and there's also packs of wolves and wild horses. I mean, yeah, it's pretty crazy, but you know, radiation is such that, you know, um, if you don't dust anything up, maybe you won't be fine, but one little microbe, you know, you're done, you know, forever. And then when you die, that microbe stays around, gets in the soil, someone else gets it. I mean, this thing don't go away. And uh, let the Raptor 4, the one that went down, was, wasn't was encased in concrete when we were there. And what's this, this is one. What's, the, what's this photo you sent me? This is a, I mean, this is a school room that was left and these are just stacks of books. Um, 10 years later, I guess, people, you know, this is what yeah. it looks like. I'm sure it looks different now, but I mean, this place, I don't want to touch. I, I like collecting things, but no way was I going to touch anything. <laughs> not, radioactive, my, not radioactive things. <laughs> no, no. It, I took off my clothes. Everything was like, bye-bye, you know, and we took like uh, pills beforehand. Um, I think they're iodine um, pills, uh, but they don't really tell you much, you know? Yeah, it'll be fine. No, I won't. I said, but, 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 but what's the number that like, What's the number? And they wouldn't tell me. I was like, mm. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it was it was cool. It was cool. I'm glad I'm not going back. Let's do another clip um, while we're at it. Um, I don't know what this one is. Hmm. Let's see I, if it's wrong. I'll... Backbreaker, though, huh? Oh, here we go. Here we go. Backbreaker, though, huh? I'm in the inside of the Great Pyramid of Khufu right now. It's amazing. I'm walking all the way up to the king's chamber. 2.3 million stones make up this pyramid. These ceilings are corbelled, which means they're displacing all the weight. It's an inverted pyramid, yeah. Yeah, I buddy. Mean, I mean, talk about this job takes me to the most coolest places. And um, I knew about this chamber, you know, from us watching like back in the day, you know, uh, pyramid stuff that was always on History Channel, or whatever. I never thought I'd actually go there, but it's they designed the pyramids with this ramp going sideways up all to this chamber. It's like a 10 foot by 12 foot big slabs, just room. That's it. There's no engravings on it. Nothing. It's an it's, no one knows really. They say it's a, yeah. a tomb, but there's no tomb stuff in it, you know. Um, and I tell you what, though, we got real quiet and my sound man, you know, that got us real quiet and this crazy energy in that King's chamber and super claustrophobic getting up there. Um, I bet, but they, man. they built, it looks like they built the chamber first and the walkway and then built around it because they can't, I mean, the whole thing was crazy. Now I talked about the corbel ceilings. Uh -huh. I was like displacing the uh -huh. same exact thing is in South America with the pyramids and they didn't supposedly speak to each other. So it's a way of, so that the weight, the weight displaces down and it's, it's really cool. You know, Hey, um, somebody from, uh, that we grew up with this. Hi, Evan. I'm so proud of you and Drew Polly that we grew up with up in, up in the Bronx. Yes, what's yes. up? What's up, Polly? Old school, New York hardcore gal, a seven, uh, yep. re represent. 
um, that's that said. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it is, I tell you one thing: all the the early work we've did, Drew, um, with the music videos and everything we've done, really kind of comes up to what I'm doing today. Um, and the the down and dirty filmmaking, the get make sure you get the moment, you know, um, you know, find realizing what the moment is and staying with it, you know. Um, and also, my climbing background um, is always in effect. We're always climbing and rappelling. Sometimes our shoots start four hours hike in. So, and, and also, I want I want also I learned this later is that Josh Gates, who hosts the show, has a background. His family owned a diving shop. It was a diving shop, right? Yeah, so that's yeah. why there's a lot of diving on the show. You guys go into the water a lot. Yep, yep. I mean, I'll tell you a good dive story. We we just did a thing on um, on uh, Normandy Beach. We did a big World War II uh, yeah, man. thing. And uh, we went diving uh, at the site where um, at Normandy Beach. Omaha beach and all that right off the beach. And there was, it was 110, 15 foot dive, which is really deep, mm. dark and cold. And mm. there's these ships in there, just like ghost ships all twisted from bombs and tanks still on them and stuff like that. And uh, we found a live um, mine. Uh, uh, it was a floating mine uh, that eventually sank, but it was live and it was really scary because it was still live. We had to call the Coast Guard and stuff like that. Um, these mines that we found are really interesting. They they would they would sink them um, like about 20, 15 feet, 20 feet below the surface, but they put a timer on it that it wouldn't go off right away. So they all the, the allies would, you know, come through already and then it would start bombing. So what a terrorizing situation. You know, you don't know when. So and well, and I saw and I saw the, the hillside at uh, Omaha Beach where they had to climb and grapple up. Yeah. Unbelievable. Hey, when, when, yeah. when, when, when you're, when you're ever like in the water, like I know you told me a story about one time you probably the scariest dive was uh, Martha's Vineyard. Like, cause the water, like you, this little, uh, this little rock outs like near Martha's Vineyard and the water was really like really powerful and murky. And you know that there's great white yeah. sharks out there. Yeah. Like, like you ever been in the water and just been like, yo, I'm, I want out. Yeah. I mean, usually <laughs> when, yeah, that that was a good one. Usually, when it's murky or river mouth uh, and it's cold, and they bump first, you know, especially you know these sharks, they bite first. They they um, so but the scariest dive I ever did was in uh, Lake Michigan during the winter. I did an ice dive, full face mask, and they were, I was tethered, and the tether got wrapped around me, oh. and then yeah, and then my full face mask started flooding, <sighs> and I was just holding it and filming at the same time, and I was upside down, and then I, I had to get unraveled. It was. Oh, it's really scary. All our dives aren't. Uh, none of them are, are nice. They're usually <laughs> find, finding gold in a in a river, like, you know. Or when or, you uh, guys go down into a cave and go into the water in the cave, it's like oh, yeah, why not? Right? I mean, why not? Right? <laughs> I mean, we're doing it. We're doing an adventure show. Believe me, right. if it's like something to do crazy, we're I'm the first one in. You know, it's fun. Yeah. Hey, I got to uh, let me shout out a sponsor. Yes. Um, and uh, we'll be right back. And we'll get it, we'll bring on a special guest and we'll get into some music. All right. Yes. What's happening, boys, girls, loved ones from around the world? This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. And we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, Your Core Hardcore Fan Page, Chacho's Tacos, DTFM Vinyl Distro, and of course, our friend. Josh from Chain Reaction Records. I want to bring him on. What's up, bro? Hey, what's happening, man? You, you look you look look like you're enjoying yourself watching watching the show. Huh? It, it, was, it was great, man. Um, hey, bro, bro, is that my DOA poster you got behind you? Come on right, now. Right there. <laughs> Dude, what's one of my, my what's one happening, of my, brother? Great memory is uh, watching uh, Naked and Afraid with with my son when he was a little bit younger. Is he would laugh his ass off at all the naked people, <laughs> you know. There was, you know, they're naked and afraid. So it would be, it was a lot of fun watching that show with with my son. He would just be cracking up, and he couldn't. You got to ask my brother some naked and afraid questions. He couldn't handle the the nudity. Hey, you got my my revelation beanie on. Yeah, what's the latest? Two, two feet us, of snow us, in Denver. Give us a quick rundown. 
Yeah, we're supposed to get two feet of snow. So what helps melt the snow is some uh, sick tunes here. This came out, I think it came out last year, but we were just able to get our, our hands on it. This is a band called Safe from the Black Forest of Germany. Is that right? Um, melodic hardcore. Uh, with the definitely have that youth crew vibe to them. I don't know if they're they're straight. That's pretty funny. From the Black Forest of Germany, they definitely have that youth crew vibe. Yeah, it, it's Black Forest youth crew, man. <laughs> That's hard, bro. That's I, I I assume they're straight edge because they also have a very uh, uh, Krishna um, thing vibe going on as as well. This album is is good, but this is the seven inch that that came out after it. And I really dig the seven inch. Uh, is it's a it's a lot heavier. So this was a little bit more in my wheelhouse than than the LP. But if that you know like early shelter uh, is for you, you probably dig dig safe. I think they have a direct distribution with with Revelation in the Nick Nick the Sabbath US. says Nick Sa Nick Black Sabbath says safe is Krishna core. Yeah, the, yeah. The, there's an earlier seven inch where the album cover. Yeah is uh, some, some Krishna artwork for sure. So the, the, the big news is all the Bad Brains represses. It, right on. Pay to Come just, just dropped. We sold out of that almost instantly. As soon as it was in the door, they were back out of the door. This is my copy, but uh, this gets reissued. Uh, what is that? Is, is that Pay to Come, what, or, or is that the cassette? This is the Roar cassette on yeah, vinyl. Roar cassette. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And this is actually on on Roar Records. This is my personal copy. Right. But it's being uh, repressed and dropped on uh, on April twenty third, and then shortly after that, on July thirtieth, Rock for Life gets dropped. Right. And then uh, is that the old copy? Is that is that the new copy or the old copy? This is this is mine. This is an older copy. Yeah, because because like Lenny says, there was always an issue with that with the speed. The speed, like they sped yeah. it up and it sounded weird and, and like they ruined they kind of ruined that record with what they did to it, you know. So and then uh I and I survived drops on, on June 25th. The record label that's putting this stuff out is called Org Music. I don't mm -hmm. know much about them. I looked at their kind of roster of bands and they're all over the place. Mm -hmm. Bad Brains must have worked out a, a killer deal with them. There wasn't any information on uh, Eye Against Eye. I imagine that SST's got a freaking stranglehold on, on that one. You would think not so. let it go, nor have they repressed it in a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, there wasn't any info on, on the quickness either, which cool. I, those two I personally need on, on vinyl. I came across a copy of the quickness the other day. The guy wanted 75 bucks. Ah. I was like, ah, I'm gonna wait and see if it gets repressed. Yeah, no, they're they're, print, they're repressing a whole bunch of that stuff, but probably not the major label stuff, right? Yeah, it was that quickness was on was on Caroline. So Bad Brain stuff is on all these different labels. Yeah. So mm -hmm. probably really hard for them to get their arms wrapped around it, brought back in in house, and work out this deal with with Org Music. But we'll see what happens. So you've got cool. April, uh, June, and July are the are the three drops right now. Right on. All right. Well, thank you, brother. This is a really cool episode, and the the, the, the stories are, are awesome. Yeah, you hey, hold on. You want to meet my brother? Yeah, hey, yeah. That, that'd be amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah man, what's happening, dude? I, I, I got a I got a naked and afraid story. It's really funny. All right. I, I do naked and afraid, and uh and I love the show. It's like it's the realest show on TV. I mean, like they're starving themselves. Like, is it's not fake, I can tell you that. It, we don't help them at all. And uh so I'm like just fresh i was like i know the show and uh, you know I, it's hard when you just start something like any job you don't know the format too well and uh, the one of the, the scenes is in the beginning when they take their clothes off right and the the guy the guy takes his clothes off for the first time and i'm all filming and this fucking donkey fucking thing comes whack comes out i'm like everyone's like oh. it was like like that <laughs> i don't usually look but yo that shit was like bam right and then i was like oh, wow. yeah, nice. i know right i mean if, <laughs> and then uh and then and he starts going in the muck. It was in, it was in like a jungle. And then we meet the girl, and she's like really hot. And I say I don't know what they're doing here. I, I get it, <laughs> you know. Anyway, that first look when they looked at each other, and and I'm, I zoomed it on her face. I was waiting for her to look down, you know, because the, that they oh, yeah. use that edit, you know. And then she did. And I was, we're all just pretty laughing. And then of course, twenty days in, 
his junk is in the dirt, man. Her junk's in the dirt. It's all dirty, dirty turtle things. And <laughs> it, it don't even look right, dude. I mean, they're. I mean, they don't care anymore. It's just in the right. dirt. Um, and uh, wow, he was I, a. I got it. Yeah. I got a question. Oh, actually, here's a question from our friend Al Barrill. You remember from SSD Control? I dragged you to go see them at Irving Plaza in 1982. He says. Can Evan describe the health and safety infrastructure yeah. set up behind the Naked and Afraid show? Do yeah. the crew and doctors have a special bus or temporary building set up for sleeping and, and eating? Yeah, yes, we do. We have a doctor on set. Um, basically, the, 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 there's a, there's, it's just a cameraman uh, and the producer. And the audio, we, we, you know, we plant mics places because they're naked. And actually, they have a, um, a, a self-recording device in their like, little thing. And for sure, they get checkups every three days. If they have a problem, if something gets infected, uh, we will look at it. Obviously, if it's a problem, we'll give them something. So that's really the only thing that may happen because we we want them to be safe. Um, and we we stay in a really sweet eco lodge, like a twenty minute ride away, and it's like. A, I'm, you know, it's just like I'm, I'm drinking, and the next day you, I stay the same size. You know, they get low, and then they are, they ask you questions like, like, oh, what did you have last night? And like, oh, you know, I smell something on your breath. You know, and then of oh. course I was waiting for like, yo, just drop a Snickers bar, and we'll be good. You know, yeah. like so. It, no, it's out there it, eating bugs and shit. Yeah. yeah, and you know what the 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 problem is this like, and I totally get it like. When you first arrive there, you got to get shelter, right? And you got to secure where the water is and all. But people don't know that. They just start building stuff. Oh, man, everything goes, their energy level goes down because they're yeah. not going to find meat. Come yeah. on. They're not going to yeah. find, what, you ever try looking for anything that's living as a human? They're gone. They, they see you, they smell you, they're gonzo. You got to know, like, you got to smoke out that hole because that's where that little rat thing is. And you got to, like, that, that ant, you know, and all that. You know, so but they don't know. I saw I saw an episode that was in Florida, and yeah. like, if I had my choice anywhere, I I I do the one in Florida, yeah. and right away as soon as I got there, I'd go I'd go bash some alligators' heads in, man. And, and you like say that, you say that, but like these people are they're not like me or you. They're legit outdoorsmen, and they always have a problem. But it, so you, they, you but it never see seems like there's food anywhere. Right. You can't sneak them to any food, but have they ever? Have you ever indulged on a sweet grub? Like, hey, man, hey, yeah, try this, Evan. I do. Yeah, yeah? does an ant, a cutter ant, taste like lemon? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's really cool. And uh, and certain barks, you gotta know. In certain roots, yeah. like bamboo roots, the real fresh stuff, the the, the babies you can eat. You, you just gotta know each place. And yeah. really, if you go into the jungle, it's a lot different than Florida in Ecuador. You know. Um, but they all get stomach issues for long periods of time. All those people have stomach bugs and real weird stuff. Yeah, yeah. But it's uh, that's the real they really show. Should, they really should call it like starving, like starving, and like they should rename it like starving with one other person. I know. That's what and it is. It's really it's what it is. They just throw them out there and they starve for twenty days. Well, yeah, yeah. And you think it's like, oh, it's, oh, they're naked, it's so hot. It's like a porno set, probably. It's like, oh, no, like one, two, four minutes in, you're like, ooh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Here's, here's one, here's one, Ev, uh, from Chris Hoffman. Where was the most gnarly spot you went to for Naked and Afraid? Well, for Naked and Afraid, we went to Ecuador in this, um, well, it was, it was part of a, it was part of a, um, a, a delta that comes out from the Amazon, right? So you imagine this, nothing is land. It's all these little islands of like stuff that's kind of compiled together, right? So these islands sometimes are big, sometimes they're small. And there's, there's, there's not only, al there's not only alligators in there, but there's, um, you can look in the water at night and you see electric eels <laughs> hitting other things and other things, serpents. And then there's, there's oh man, there's so much shit that can kill you in the, in the Amazon. Um, that that's really the gnarliest place, but the gnarliest place in Expedition Unknown is a, is a good question too, because there's so many places. Uh, I mean, the second largest cave in the world um, is um, in Ecuador, and we 
um, went down there to look for this metal library, this mythical library, um, and it's called a Tyos Cave. You guys should check it out. And we had to rappel 400 feet down. We had to get winched down. We stayed there for three days. There's things living in there with no eyes, there's birds that use echolocation, and I had a full-on panic attack. You know, like a panic attack, you're like, okay, everything's fine. But no, this is like, I'm in a, no, I'm not fine. You know, and I didn't know how to get out. I couldn't get out, you know, because no, you can't walk out. You got to be winched up. Um, and then we went to the, the deepest part and we started exploring deeper and deeper. And um, remember those Thai kids that got caught in that yeah. in the cave? It's yeah. the same thing. If there was a flash flood when we are down there, we would have got, Fucked up, and one of the, the to get to this one part, we had to swim under about five feet and come up to another chamber. And dude's like, "It's okay." I was like, "No, it's I don't can't see. There's no rope. It's it, it, you get weird when you get into those situations. You just get like safety goes out the window. You're like, that's a great shot. Let's go." And uh, we did that, and then we entered this cave, this chamber that was like a magical. It was this big bell um, st stalactite huge belt crystal with like look like diamonds it, it was just like it was the biggest uh, one that anyone's ever seen and that's where we ended the show and it was really special and then like all the shows that we do we have to make our way back and that's a journey from the farthest pictures of the world back to this back to the hike to the bus to the mm, to the, mm, do, 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 do. and uh embrace the suck you know <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. Yeah, I had a drop, guys. Nice to meet you, Evan. My my nice. son's a big fan of uh, Expedition Unknown as well. We watched Thank that. Thank you, Josh. That, Thank you for nice. the sponsor, brother. Hey, you guys take care. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I got the greatest sponsors on the show, man. So, so many. So well, many it, it looks like we could do much more. Your time's almost up. You know, let's let's. We didn't even talk about us, Stone uh, Stone Brothers. Shit. You know. Hey, you know who? You know who? I want to bring a friend of ours on. Uh, listen, it, you know what? Before I do that, let, let's do this. Because somebody asked about, somebody asked, let, let me see if I can find this comment. If it, uh, let, me, let me see. Um, something about dad. Let me see. Uh, ah, here you go. Hold on. I got, I got a picture to go with it, even though I look yes. like a freaking knucklehead in this picture. So... Did your father have an influence on both of you to become filmmakers and video makers? 100%. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's uh, Drew, I think you're producing that. I was a boom man. We all started in the business early on. Uh, our dad, Arnie Stone's a commercial director. He's retired now, but we grew up on sets, uh, work ethics, 14 hour days. That's just normal for us. So um, we work, we, we knew what hard work was and, uh, I think what pushed us most back in the day was uh, other, we were PAs, production assistants, you know, really low, but all our other PA friends, all, all of us started rising at the same time. And because we're director's sons, we got looked at a little bit differently and we had to really say, no, we are good and really fight harder to be, um, to, to have respect. Uh, that's how I felt at least. Um, so and then and then we I got a big break. Um, I did a music video for a baby band, um, this band White Trash, and uh, they they um, they this band got um, picked up by Electra. This is this is how I got my start. Uh, it was a music video, five thousand dollars. It was a friend of mine's um, who's managing my friend Ross Elliott, and um, we did the video. It turned out great. They, they got picked up, and Electra said, "You know what? Let's use the video instead of." redoing a video because they're cheap but it's also really good turn Can out I to be happy right there yeah i'd like to bring an old friend of ours on bass player in white trash played in murphy's law in butterbrain from rockaway beach queens mr aaron <laughs> what? that's right the first uh, rockaway beach introduction i got i'm a yeah. new newcomer you know to rockaway what? beach and you know what since we're kind of doing this bit here Let's um, let me play a little bit of the video. Now I'm going to try to not play a lot of the audio, so so I, so I don't get uh, so I don't get hammered. But uh... <laughs> so yeah, I'm cheating. I'm cheating the audio so we don't get flagged. I'm, I'm, it's the first time I'm, I'm I'm trying to do this, but.
Yeah, this is the first this is a first Buzzbin rotation video on MTV and it basically launched uh our careers, both of us and um and off to the races. Uh I started doing music videos. We're talking 91 here, I think. And uh and it was shot underneath the Queen's Bridge, I think, and it doesn't look like that now, does it? <laughs> <laughs> that it was probably You know, this, this song's got a great hook, man. Oh, uh, yeah, and the vocal recording. <laughs> the vocals are just recorded, like, on top of layered, some in a way. I don't know how you did it, guys, but it, it feels like. Well, just this, this was actually, as you said, it was uh, a demo version of the song. Um, Ross Elliott, who was the connection, you know, between all of us, um, he, was, we, he actually signed us as a, to a publishing deal. Yep. Before we got signed, so he he had the the bright idea to to you know he knew saw that we were a visual live band. He wanted to do a music video, and uh, so I, he he did a four song demo with the video as a package to shop the labels. And uh, and sure enough, they they uh, to both our credit, they, they they decided to say yeah, we're not going to cut anything else. They actually remade us. They made us re recut the audio to the demo so that it would. Uh, you know, correct some flaws in the demo. We did we redid some horn parts for the demo. But, but this it, but this this version, the audio in this version of this video that was the first MTV Buzzbin was the demo, totally the demo. Our, it was our demo, which in some ways I, I always believed that demo was was better than you know the the album that they spent a shitload of money on, and uh, and the video <laughs> the video was certainly better than any videos we did after that. So. Um, you know, it, 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 I, you know, we, we did it rough. And you know, you, we captured the uh, energy of the band before, before all the problems, before all the rock star problems after getting signed. And of course, that right there, a tribute to your brother, Ethan Collins, who passed away a couple of years ago. You, he was a kind soul. He was a good man. And uh, we miss him very much. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, talk a little about like the energy back then as young filmmakers. I'm sorry, go ahead. As young filmmakers and young uh, band members starting out, you know, that certain magic that I think we connected with, we both were in the same place, like hungry, arr, like, and we had that same vibe too. Like uh, my camera work is the same. It's always moving. It's, it's one shot to another. If you look at my work now, you'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. You know? <laughs> and, and also a real shout out to the young filmmakers out there that today, um, you know, we were do to get into film business back in the eighties and nineties and early nineties, you had to get in through music videos and it's saw shot in film and you needed money, man, it was hard. I mean, you don't like now you use your iPhone, which is great and God bless. And it's a lot of opportunities. Um, not saying, yeah, it was really hard back then to get in the business. Luckily enough, we were jumped in, but also we made our own like Drew's doing now with this show. You have to make your own. No, everyone has a car, but they're not race car drivers. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> yeah. So all you filmmakers out there, just like go for it, do what you love and, and make that video, man. Make that video because you got to show up. Yeah, that's, well, that's really well said, Evan. I, you know, I just want to say it, it really is too. We're talking about a different era where, like, you know, not everybody could go out and make a music video. And as a band, you know, doing a publishing deal with Ross, the the to, to have you know someone put some money and invest some time behind us to make you know put us in the studio to make a demo and like and and, and tell us we were going to have a music video made, not not knowing that it was going to be on MTV and not knowing that it was going to help break the band. Um, was it was a huge deal for us. It wasn't like you know nowadays, like you know, all right, bust the iPhones, make another music video. Um, it, it, it was a project back then, you know, it, and and it, it was a lot of investment. That's right. Well, and I think I think Aaron also. I know you and I have talked about this, you know, a lot of ways. Uh, you know, everyone was really young, 
And you guys were really young, thrown into the situation where, boom, you, you do a demo, <laughs> the demo video, it's on MTV, you sign a, a major label deal, and then you guys kind of, it, it gets crazy. You're young, you turn on each other. Yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> really? I know that. You pretty much yeah. wrapped it up right there. It's pretty much how it went down. Like, And, um, and it's not unique. Yeah, and it's not, you know, you think it's unique because you're living the situation and you hear the story like, you know, from, from other bands later, it really isn't unique, especially that era, it seemed like, you know. Um, but uh, but it, it all was a whirlwind. It happened like if that little, you know, year of time or two years of time felt like a lifetime. You know, it was like so much happening fast, you know, just from from doing club gigs to having, the, you know, the demo and the video getting signed. And then next thing being on tour and like with a video, you know, in, in rotation on MTV. Yeah. It was like, a, you know, a kid's dream, you know. Now, now. You guys, you guys have kind of come full circle. I know in Butterbrain, some of the guys from White Trash are in that band, right? Absolutely, yeah. It's it's uh, me, Sally May, uh, on vocals. Uh, you know, it's staple in the in the New York hardcore scene. Yo, what's, and, uh, yo, what's up, Sally May? <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we get yeah, basically um, a couple of the dudes from White Trash, Mike on drums, and some of the horn players. And and, and, we, white, and 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 but white trash is you're doing shows as white trash as well, right? So yeah, we we are actually we, we just got we're doing just started uh, getting some writing sessions together with uh, white trash and uh, and butterbrain. So everything's kind of happening at the same time. Um, but the white the white trash what what we kind of uh, uh, reinvoked our, our career again was after my brother died. We kind of stopped playing for a minute. I had, you know, formed Butterbrain, so I was doing, getting my rocks off with that. And um, and White Trash got invited to do this Monsters of Rock cruise, which all went down right before the uh, pandemic hit, right? It was about a year year ago this time, it was in February last year. And uh, so we did a, a tribute show for my brother, and and a week later went off on this cruise, and it kind of uh, reinvigorated our career. We, you know, had a bunch of show offers lined up, talking about, you know, writing some new stuff and and putting a new album out and then boom, the pandemic hit. So, um, you know, everybody's a little spread out. So we put a lot of that stuff on hold. Um, I did put out a few Butterbrain uh, songs and videos in the meantime, as Evan said, it's uh, a good time to stay active. I kind of used the pandemic time to, you know, uh, provoke, you know, provoke me to kind of get to work and, you know, all right, I'm stuck inside. What can I do, you know? Um, hey, uh, just, just I uh, gotta ask for my brother. How's the, how's the surf out in Rockaway? <laughs> Probably not as good as Huntington Beach. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I I surfed there. I surfed there once, and I got caught up in this in this, this pier that was under the water, about yes. only, only like two feet. Yeah, and so yeah. I didn't see it. I was, I was, like, oh, I was getting yeah. like bit. Oh, I've gotten sticked a few times out in uh, Rockaway. Yeah, Rockaway is uh, it's e it, it's either like like mellow and <laughs> and not really firing. <laughs> Or firing too much. It's like so. There's there's not really like too many intermediate days. There's like a couple of days for beginners, and then it turns into like the full on like fucking monster waves, like you know, with with, with crazy rips, and and of course the sticks, the infamous sticks that are uh, at high tide. They're underneath the water, so you if uh, you have to, you always have to kind of know where they are without seeing them. <laughs> hey, That's hey Aaron, Aaron, um, I want to thank you for coming on. And Thank you, brother. I, I love I love playing music with you, bro. And uh, when when this thing ends, man, we we we're gonna get the Drew Stone Hit Squad back together. And I really hope that you 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 have the time and you can play with us, man. One hundred percent. Butterbrain would always love to come back and do the uh, A Seven shows too. You know, you know, you guys are Butterbrain's coming back to the A Seven. Love that. Love that. Part of our A Seven family. So I uh, love you, bro. And we'll love the Stone you. family. Much respect, guys. Great to see you, Evan. Thank you, Aaron. Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> you know, hey, I, every, I tell you one thing, every job you do has to be great because that job set my career in motion. And if I didn't do a good job, it wouldn't happen. So it's weird how life works. And as far as work goes, every job you do has to be perfect. Um, so there. Let's yeah. talk about. Oh, hold on. I, hold on. Oh, it's, not, it, it's not the Haven. Hold on. Let me, let me find it again. Hold on. That that song that song fucking sticks in your head, man. Yeah, it's good. You know, it really does. What the hell's going on? I got called from uh, my ment, one of my mentors, my boss at Tom Jeff Panzer. 
he saw it on MTV. He's like, hey, how'd you like to work with me? And I was like, in, in LA, he gave me a salary as an in-house director at Electra. And I was just like, see ya, New York. <laughs> it was great. Well, that, that we got we we got a couple of things to to get into. Um, let's do let's do this right now because this this is going to be very interesting. So, this is an article from Backstage Magazine uh, from 1984, and it talks about 18 year old Evan Stone directing a short film clip for Antidote for his brother as uh, Drew Stone. Blah blah. blah. Tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, you know, right? I didn't go to college. We didn't go to college. I didn't go to college for filmmaking. Yeah. We just got out and started doing it. I got myself in a, a camera that had Claire NPR right there with an ingenue lens, and we were just doing it. You know, of course, I was doing anything, everything. Like, you got a, you got a video? You want me to do it? You know, like, just no money. Didn't matter. I was poor. So we did uh, We did this music video it was from your band, Antidote, at the time. And, uh, yeah, let's check it out. Yeah, so this, this, how do I even set this up? This is, this was a, but wasn't this a, this was a student film, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm not, you know, not, I wasn't a student anywhere, but it was just like a proof of concept that we're good, that we can do something, you know, just give me the ball. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're going to do this. This has never been seen publicly. Yes. It's a very interesting video. Everybody looks very young in it. A little background on it. Um, on this is this is the band Antidote. When I joined it initially, that's Arthur Googie of the Misfits playing drums. That's his brother-in-law Brian playing bass. Of course, Nunzio playing guitar. This is uh, Antidote. This is this this has never been released. This has never been. It's it's very interesting. So. 1984, guys. So give it. 1984. Give it give it some slack. Yeah. So hold on, let me let me let me find this stuff. Uh, bom, bom, bom. This should, is, it's pretty long, so you might want to cut somewhere in the middle. No, nope, I'm gonna play the whole thing. Right and on. while it's happening, you could you could anybody could get up and do their thing. And uh, here we go. And that's me. You will see. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid.
Not so bad. Doesn't suck. And you know what? <laughs> it, if it was cut shorter, it'd be good. And I, I love the way it was a dream at the end. Don't worry. It's just a dream. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a dream. Don't worry. <laughs> it wasn't bad. Didn't suck. I, I well, didn't suck. And for, yeah. I, it's never I like been, it. It's never been. Actually, the, the, the music, when, when uh, our friend Drew Carolyn put out his CBGB's book of, of matinee photos, uh, the Radio Raheem, uh, there was a seven inch that was accompanied it. And I gave them the video and they lifted the audio off it. That song, Deadly Rain, is on that Drew Carolyn seven inch. But oh. I've never posted that video up publicly. I'm just not, I just never was in the mood to just deal with it, you know? Yeah, because you know well, what's going to come, you know? Like, you know, here and we look. Yeah. It's the 80s, guys. Come on. Everyone's doing it. It was great. It was great, and I want to shout. And I want to shout out Arthur Googie playing mm. drums, Brian, and even Nunzio. Yep, you know Nunzio so. did the uh, graffiti in the in the front. Um, of oh, it did he? Well. Yep, he did all the. It was really wow. cool. It was really cool. My my uncle, no, my uncle. Uh, um, did Uncle uh, Richie edit it? Uncle Richie edited it, and um, yeah. And we, we cut on a stand up movieola, which is like old school, like <laughs> film, like you know, eight mad shit, like yeah. <laughs> the first non linear editing, <laughs> considering. Um, yep. So yeah, it, it's on from there. You know, it's I've been doing short form programming ever since. You know, about that length. I want to talk about where is it? Hold on, I got so many pictures here, man. Um, she got to that hook way sooner. That whole open was just like, oh gosh, let's get to the good part. <laughs> no, because we because it was a film. Yeah, well, yeah, I, it was deep, man. And your girlfriend Debbie Weiner was my sister's friend. Uh, hi, Debbie. Uh, Debbie Listen, Weiner. Man, don't start in with girl. Don't yeah. You know her. <laughs> All right, you know her. I hate her. All no. right, let's talk about. This. Oh yeah. A little, a little bit now. Oh yeah. I, 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 I'll, I'll let me. I'll do the setup and then you take it over, okay? Yeah. So we, the Stone Brothers, had a gig. Uh, if you guys remember the 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 Nativity, this is different, bro. We oh. were doing. We were doing. A, a, we interviewed him for the Nativity in Black. Yes. Uh, Black Sabbath. Um, record that came out, and and we we went and interviewed Lemmy, and actually, you know what? We interviewed Lemmy, and also um, where is there's another shot from from that shoot. Hold on, where is? Oh yeah, th th this one. Hold, on, I'm getting to it. Uh, hang with me. Um, this is from the same day. This is the Stone Brothers and John Christ, who played on the first couple of Danzig records, oh, right? Yeah. So John Christ, but the 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 Lemmy. So we were interviewing Lemmy, right? Yeah. And he was not. Yeah, was I got the, of, the the Lemmy story is it's yeah. one of my classic rock and roll stories. So yeah, we're. I need to do you know it's a professional gig. You know we're doing interviews and we're doing this behind the scenes stuff and. I was young and, you know, I was like, let me for Motorhead, you know, the ice of spades. Yeah, I know that guy, you know. Um, and, um, man, he sits down at the interview. He's just all fucking, just all, all over the place. And I he was, was like. Shot. He was not, he was like. Dramatic. Yeah, he was like a rock and roll tragedy, you know, and he's all over the place. And uh, he goes, I go, hey, man, could we do this? I'm really, it's really important. He goes, yeah, put me up full screen now. This is a good story. Go ahead. Um, and he says, uh, he says, hold up, mate. Uh, let me get right. And he takes his bag, not this bag. This is something else. He <coughs> takes his bag, bam. And it's like crystal. Right. And he's like, he takes his fucking drink. He had this fucking something on the rocks, dips his finger in it, takes a sip of alcohol of his drink, washes it down, chocks his head, closes his eyes, looks at me and goes, all right, mate, we're straight. And he fucking killed it. He gave me Nailed such a good it. He nailed it. He got straight. That shit says, and it was <laughs> like, like, it was like big old like plow. Put it like it was like this is his meds for the day. 
And uh, and that was funny because he just laser like he was like boom. He started just talking to me like on point, everything I need to know. It was, was like, like all of a sudden everything was like turbo focus. Like ooh. yeah, I didn't know. I was like okay, you know. But that's some rock and roll shit right there. No, and no, yeah, no. I mean, hey, here's here's I, here's an interesting question. Um, and and actually, you know, it's a question from our friend Al, Al Burrell. Um, let me let me set it up. Let, let, okay. How did you guys get into the bike scene? Did you have a ever have a bad ending with crash to a bike shoot? And let me post this as well. Uh, boom. So, uh, how do we get into the bike scene? Well, I I'll tell you. Um, we had a reputation for doing extreme sports films and videos, and um, you know, my brother was did the whole hoax series which was a whole inline skating series. And I, you know, I was doing, you know, I had a reputation with doing the, the, the bio, you know, producing the biohazard videos and a, a lot of the hardcore street stuff. And someone brought it to our attention. That's someone being um, Mr. Caves from the Lords of Brooklyn, out in Brooklyn, um, brought it to our attention that these guys out in Brooklyn, um, you know, there was this sort of this, this um, scene going on. And I looked at it and it was really interesting and um, it was a bunch of Italian guys from Brooklyn, and I, I got I got in touch with I got in touch with my brother, and mm -hmm. uh, we all got together. Me, my brother, Caves, his wife, and a couple other people, and we do, we we did this film, Twelve O'clock, um, which basically turnkeyed the sport extreme sports films. And then after that, me and my brother went on and did the Urban Street Bike Warriors series of films. You got a couple back there? Yeah. We got the 12 o'clock. We got Urban Street Bike Warriors. We got fucking, we got, we got so many. We got like 12 titles at that point, <laughs> you know? Yeah, uh, we yeah. went on a run. We, we did, uh, we did illegal drag race videos. We did, we did car stuff. Which one is that? You know? Wait, what, which one is that? Playground of Power. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That's what your boys, the, the, um, Dan, Dan Perella. What was his name? Parola, the Parola racing team. Oh, crashes, that was crashes and asses. That's just crashes and bashes. Yeah. Oh, no asses. And Black Sheep Squadron. That's right. So, so that was so fun. Al's, Al's question: Did anything bad ever happen? Why don't you tell the story about? Well, you know, luckily enough, we played with the with the guys who don't crash too much. I mean, they're going 100 miles an hour on a, on a highway, and the jokers from behind are the ones you got to be careful of. They. Nah. And uh, the first, pretty much one of the first shoots we did, Drew didn't know any better, was standing in the middle of the street. And this guy was doing a, where you sit on the, the you sit on the tank, you put your feet over and you rap, rap, and you do a wheelie like that. And he crashed and took Drew out and broke your leg. And uh, and it was a scene. And I was, was like, bad, oh, man. first day out. No. It was, a, it was a really, 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 really bad scene. We were mm -hmm. out late at night. Um, we, 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 we were under the BQE. There was a graveyard on either side of us. Yeah, I was in the street shooting. I had my eye in the lens and shooting the action in front of me. And one of these guys was dicking around behind me and he uh. lost control of the bike. And I turned around and it hit me yeah. and um, it's, I got smoked and I, I broke my leg like under my kneecap, which is a really bad place mm. to, to break your leg. Um, and it was a really, really, and I just remember when I got hit by the bike and, and, and I went up in the air, I remember just thinking, just protect your head, protect your head. Cause I was coming back. I, it, it, it hit me and I went flying and, and I managed to get my hand up in front of my head before I hit the concrete mm. and my hand hit mm. the concrete, like really so hard mm. that when, when the ambulance came, they asked me what hurts. And I was like, my hand. Meanwhile, I couldn't feel my leg, and it's a really – it was a scary thing. It was horrible. You know, my brother was there, and I didn't, we didn't know how bad I was hurt, and um, it, was, it, was, it was horrible. And, you know, I think Chris Pisani here says Drew and Evan worked the next day. That's right. We, we did. It was Dad's shoot. It was we, on the line decker shoot. I showed up for the next day, and my leg was busted pretty much, yeah. and – he didn't care. He was pissed. Dad was pissed, man. Yeah. Talk about 
talk about wait words of wisdom from Arnie Stone. Dad was pissed. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know what? It sucked, man, because I never. It took me years to recover. It was a bad break. Um, that was the end of that. And the other bad injury we had was when the time we went snowboarding. You shouldn't snowboard. Well, wow, you broke yourself, you know. I don't know. I, I, we, 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 we drove up to friggin' Big Bear, and it was freezing out, and it was yeah. all ice, and oh, we yeah. got out. It was one of those days. Well, we drove, what, three hours to Big Bear, and we went snowboarding, and it was way too cold, so everything was ice. And, 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 and I was starting to become a pretty good snowboarder, right? Mm -hmm. And we were zipping down the hill, and at the end of the day, I, I was, you know – and I just caught a lip and I went flying and the first part of my body to hit the concrete ice mm. was my, my clavicle. And Probably. I hit my, my first thing was my clavicle mm. and I just shattered my clavicle. So between the leg injury and my shoulder injury, that was like the end of my, uh, my, my, my field goal, my field, go my pitching career and my field field goal career. But yeah. We had a great run, man, doing street yep. bike films, man. Oh, yep. oh, wait, oh, I got a great one. Wait, I got a great one. Um, okay, talking about that, here mm -hmm. is a great shot of the Stone Brothers and two of the greats from that, from that sport right there. Oh, yeah. That's okay. Darius Kashabi and Alex Flores, you yes. know, out, 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 of, out, of, uh, out of the Bay Area. And, uh, you know, those, those guys – you know, we're in a bunch of our films, incredibly, incredibly talented writers, man. You see, you see the, the fist thing I'm doing. I used to do that, but now I do the, I do the, the hang loose. You, know, <laughs> you can tell by the era, you know, what's up, but, uh, Hey, but you know, back then I'll tell you one thing, guys who are listening, interesting. Uh, we're independent filmmakers, right? So we spent the money on making the film and then we sold it to skate shops. In this instance, it would be motorcycle shops. And we, we got with distributors who did like helmets and stuff, you know, so they took it on, had the distribution. We made, uh, let's see, we it took about four or five dollars to make the tape. We sold it for almost 19. Man, if we sold 20,000 units, we're good, you know, and it was exciting, you know, um, and it all ended when YouTube came out because then everyone got it for free. So well so you got to change your game up but it was a real time for independent filmmakers back then uh with the skate films uh, if you were a skater you went to a skate shop to get it you didn't go to netflix or anything yeah yeah and 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 the 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 every film we made and if you see and it was a labor of love and it just took months to make and it had to be great because we knew the audience um wasn't going to have anything else and they were the best sellers and everything we did so uh well, our film props. black our film black sheep squadron was a was yep. a big we did twelve o'clock black sheep no we did twelve o'clock then urban street bike right. wars then black sheep squadron and right. uh, so, these were and, these were big films man right and you know what it's kind of now is the time again for young film for independent filmmakers because uh, a lot of the networks and people aren't sending people out because of COVID and the lawyers and stuff like that so uh, here you go Travis Pastrana. You know, so if you if you can go out and, and make something a documentary, let's say, and finish it somehow, um, you're in a good place right now because um, no one's sending anyone out anyhow. So if you can take the risk, go out and do it. Uh, it's a great time. I and remember. Then, yeah. mm -hmm. No, no, go ahead. No, I was going to say something about Travis. He he was. I remember when he said, "Listen, what I do is crazy, but what these guys do." in Urban Street Bike Warriors, that's a whole nother level. Because, yeah. you know, he really respected what we were doing because we were doing it in the streets illegally. Yeah. We, were, we were going out in the middle of the night and, and we were ripping it up, man. And, tra you know, like it, it, was, it, it was big coming from Travis Pastrada, you know? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's the man. He, 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 he is the man. Um, here's uh, – listen, I like this picture um, – I'll just post this one just for a quick second. How about the Stone Brothers in pink? Huh? Oh, That's yeah. A good one. <laughs> uh, now, yeah she, she, she was married to um, our boy. What's his name? Um, yeah, the dirt bike guy. He's, she still is. Uh, not yep. Matt Hoffman. Um, no, no. Um, yeah. Uh, mm, yeah. Mm, yeah. You all know. Yeah. Tattoos. Lots of tattoos from Vegas. Nice. Who was, who was our boy? 
I liked this. I liked him. He was a friend of yours. He was the the the, the BMX dude that was like a real character. What was his name? Well, yeah, the, the, yeah he hosted the show. Oh he yeah, was, uh, yeah, yeah. What's his name? Um, yeah, punk rock guy too. Yeah, uh, he was. Yo, me and him really hit it off. But what the hell was his name? Mm, uh, mm, yeah. Anyhow, <laughs> not yeah. What the, Rich, no. Damn, he was great. He was he was awesome. But yeah, um, this is good times, you know. This is uh, us going out and filming it. No one's giving us a job. We're doing it ourselves. We're putting out the tapes. Uh, um, kind of like what you're doing now, Drew, you know. Listen, and uh, we're also do, doing some really good projects right now, y'all. We're uh, who we got this old crew. You, you, sent, you sent this to me. Chris Bazzani's watching this. Oh, that's it. Corey Hart. Kerry Hart. Carrie yeah. Hart, that's who that's who Pink's married to. Yeah, yeah, good guy. Right. That's who I, we, we met her. We yeah. were filming him. Uh, we were filming him, and 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 she was there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. There's my camera. If I talk nice to it, it wouldn't jam and fuck up my film. <laughs> that's I was like, it. Come on, yeah. baby. Now that's Chris Bazzani next to you, who's watching the show. Shout out to Chris Bazzani, and of course, uh, uh, on the end there is is Philip Leeds. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, a good friend, uh, best man at my wedding. And, um, and of course, I got my arm around uh, Kirda, uh, who uh, is a, uh, my girlfriend at the time, who is a film director these days. She directed the Devo movie. And um, what was the other movie she did um, about uh, Bob, um, Bob the dude from uh, the recovery guy, uh, Bob the Monster. She was involved mm. with, with Bob the Monster. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. Kirda out, out in Hollywood. Oh, you want to yeah. talk about Go ahead. We're doing we're doing a film right now. We're finishing post production with my dad as his executive producer. Uh, it's a it's a film about music and religion. Uh, it's called Jews and the Blues. And no, you asked, the, no, it's the Jews and the Blues. And it's a, a journey, a musical journey. We go to Israel. We talk to very unique. Um, Rick Thorne. That's Rick. it. Rick Thorne. What? Yo, I, yo, I love yo, I love my audience, man. I love you guys. <laughs> Yeah, Rick Thorne, good guy, still Rick doing his Thorne. thing, still yeah. doing his thing. I, um, MTV character. I when I work with them there, but yeah. we're doing we're Jews in the Blues, the Jews in the Blues. It's a musical documentary. My dad's executive producing. You and I are directing it. We did it right before COVID. It's going to be released in a few months. It's really cool. You know, we we interview. Israeli musicians that are pretty popular in Israel and their roots is all American blues, believe it or not. And what their version of blues is, is taking that feeling of the blues and the message and, but in taking it in their own way with a little Middle Eastern twist to it. Um, and it's really fascinating. Um, right here at the Masada, which is a very a deep place for is Jewish people. Um, it's, top of a mountain um, back in the day, the Romans laid siege to it. And this this group of people up here w committed suicide rather than to, to come into the hands of the Romans. And it's, uh, you know, um, it's a really deep message, you know, w you know, about never giving up. Um, so, and right below that, was, yeah. yeah. Um, the moral of the story here is, when in the Negev desert, don't wear black. <laughs> That's right. And, hey, you, and yeah, want to throw a little? A the, let's take a look at the trailer. Boom. How about that? That's fine. Let me let me let me find the trailer. And, and you all all Drew's fans, you're gonna see a little different part of Drew right now. Um, a different so. part of me. That's right. A little so softer, little little Grinchy hearts. Like mm, it's getting a little bigger. I got great people, man. I mean, they, they'll follow me. They love what I do. That's right. Well, they're really going to like this. It creates depth in your personality and range. Uh, so let's take a look. Like if Tell I video tape. Here we um, go. Special shout out. My name is Drew Stone. I'm a documentary filmmaker and musician born and raised in New York City. I'm also a music historian whose passion for knowledge and adventure has taken me to Israel in search of the historical connections between music and religion. We 
Because the sun is gonna shine my back door someday. Along the way, we discovered that for some people, their religion and spirituality is communicated through music, the universal language. People from many different cultures really connect to the music in a very direct way. All religions have this in common. It's how they speak to God. So come on! Hey. What, ha what happened? I don't know. I think the internet blinked out. But anyway. Hey, that what? was good. It's a tease. It's called a tease. It's Don't tease me. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that. And that's coming out soon. Um, our One of our, it's been a while since we put out a feature length documentary. And this one um, could be the start of something. Great. Listen, I'm. I'm excited. It's really, it's really my, mu it's really a musical journey. Um, there's, there's a lot of, we lost, we lost, we lost you, but hold on. We lost you at speak to God. That's right. Ooh. You know what? Hold on a second. No, hold it's on. good. This, come on. Mm -hmm. You know what? I, I'm going to, I'm going to, hold on. It's that. <laughs> Oh. The feeling is not a form of chords. It connects with people, you know, it connects people from all over the world and region and no genders and whatsoever. Where is God? Where you let him in. Where is the blues? Where you let it in. All Jewish, all Israeli, bonded together through music and religion. We are talking about music of the soul. Everybody's got their own number And everybody's got their own shoes but I know everybody's got their own blues. The first blues singer was King David. He was the first got one who taught the world how to write exactly what's coming out of my heart. Hallelujah. Join me and experience the sights. Here we are up at Masada, rich in Jewish history. Sounds and the unexpected. I play the blues, and I do it in Hebrew. On this incredible music and spiritual adventure. It's the roots. People like the roots. The original documentary film, The Jews in the Blues. The sun's gonna shine in my back door someday. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, man. Good stuff. Good stuff. We just, uh, just me and you and a producer from um, Israel, and uh, we just went out and did it. Just did it, you know, and that's important for people to know. If you, you, I think now's a good time to do a documentary if you're a filmmaker that you really just want to do. Instead of someone saying, you know, you should do a documentary on this, you should do a documentary on whatever you're interested in, whatever's that you're passionate about. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's hard enough <laughs> to finish it. And then, you know, if you don't have your heart in it, it's even harder, you know? So, yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of stories going on right now. There's a lot of, you know, pick a subject, you know? Um, Listen, man, we've been working on this film for a while. It's been, it's been, and it, it's, it's, it, but it's looking good. So, you yep. know, when you're done with the show, get back to editing, will you? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, this now, is you're, going, you're, going, you're going back out on the road with Josh in like two weeks, right? Oh, yeah. We're doing Shark Week. Uh, we got a Shark Week special in Woo! Bahamas. <laughs> and, uh, oh, man, it's crazy. We work – Discovery Channel has these two shark experts that film underwater. And I do stuff, but I don't fuck with shark, sharks. And one dude – these dudes are cowboys. They, one dude has a, a big a bite mark on his chest. And you know, another, yeah, and they're like in the water, splashing, laughing. These guys are nutty, and I love them. Uh, last year we went to uh, 
Musel Bay in South Africa, where they jump and walk. Oh, that's, jump that's out. like that's like ground yeah. zero for crazy. Yeah, man, and um, and that was crazy. And um, now we're going to Bahamas. Um, I would think we're doing something with tigers or uh, you know a group of sharks or something. But um, and then we're going to do a pirate show, a treasure show, and then we're off and doing the races about who knows what Nazi gold. What's up? You did Nazi gold already? Didn't oh you? yeah, we did Nazi gold. I yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I gotta do I gotta do a sponsor shout out, yep. and then let's come back and take questions from around the world. Okay? Boom. What's happening, everybody? Family and friends, loved ones around the planet Earth. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live, and we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, the Texas Silver Rush, Chain Reaction Records, and Skateboards. Your core hardcore fan page: DTFM, Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, and. The Organic Grill. Organic Grill is a vegan restaurant located in East Village, New York City at 123 First Avenue. Featured in New York Magazine, the New York Times, and Veg News. Their dishes have won numerous awards, including Best Veggie Burger. They make their own cheeses, sausages, and burger patties, and every dish on the menu can be made gluten-free. For all you gluten-free motherfuckers. This year, they're celebrating the 20th anniversary, and they're all about having a great time while enjoying amazing, clean food. After three months of being closed, they're now open for deliveries. Get in touch with them and order some great food at www.theorganicgrill.com. DTFM Vinyl Distro is a record store that specializes in underground music, punk, ska, hardcore, metal, and more. Located in the heart of Fargo, North Dakota's Industrial District, shop in person online at www.dtfmvinyldistro.com, where the motto is death to false metal. And last but not least, the brothers down in Corpus Christi, Texas, who have to come back on the show soon. Chacho's Tacos, located in Corpus Christi, Texas. Chacho's Tacos opened their doors in 2001, home of the almighty Chacho's Taco. They cook up an incredible home-style Tex-Mex food, and this month they're celebrating their 20th anniversary. They've been supporting underground music since the beginning, and in their own words, we ain't stopping anytime soon. Touring bands that play Corpus Christi, swing by and get a home-cooked meal at Chacho's Tacos. We got you. The underground scene will never die. Please follow us on Facebook or on Instagram. While we are at it, a couple of mentions here. Um, announcing a show, a new show. Listen, who gets all the old school New York? Here we go. Mike Gutierrez, what's up? Chachos, we are here. Love you guys in Corpus Christi. You guys are going to come on the show soon. Come back on soon. Yo, who gets all the old school New York hardcore guys that don't do interviews to come and talk? I do. Ladies and gentlemen, Wednesday, April 7th. Get your shoes and socks on. This one, I won't even say this is rare. This is unheard of. Billy Psycho from the Psychos. I dare you to find an interview with this guy. This guy was around in the early days of the New York hardcore scene. Incredible. This is going to be deep in New York history and folklore. So, Billy Psycho coming up Wednesday, April 7th. Also, while we are at it, I uh, want to remind everyone that this Friday... I am a guest on the Age of Quarantine, uh, which is the St. Vitus um, webcast. Uh, it's hosted by Chris Enriquez. That is this Friday night at 8 p.m. on Instagram at St. Vitus Bar. I am a guest on the Age of Quarantine. If you're not sick of me talking about myself, I'm sick of me talking about myself. I'm friggin' sick of it. Hopefully, we don't have to talk about the same old shit. I'm getting sick of it. Hopefully this guy asks some interesting questions and I'm going to talk about the same old crap. One more thing. Uh, the A7 um, Back to the New York Hardcore Roots compilation, which is coming out April 27th. Of course, we have an event on May 8th. Another event a week later at Generation Records, who are putting out the limited marble vinyl release. This is on Saturday, May 15th. It is a... Limited Marble Vinyl Release Event. Of course, the A7 Back to New York Car Roots, New York Car Core Compilations got Crazy Eddie, 
uh, Kings Never Die, Antidote New York Hardcore, The Car Bomb Parade, The Craze, Silence Equals Death, and on and on. So that's a new event. Listen, New York is starting to open up. Uh, the spring is coming, and we're going to do shit. Uh, that said, I want to remind everybody that there is a PayPal. Uh, there is a PayPal and a Patreon page. If you are enjoying this show and you want to support this show, this this show's like Channel Thirteen. We're like PBS. You know, it's your support is what makes this show happen, and it's your support is what has made this show happen. So there is a PayPal address there. Go check it out. Uh, it's our community within a community. Um, if you're watching this in rerun, there is a subscribe button there. Please subscribe to the show. Um, also, on follow me on Instagram. There it is. And uh, yeah, there you go. There is a PayPal address there, stone4124 at AOL. If you want to make a contribution to the show, please. That's what enables this show to happen. Everybody likes the show. Everybody likes free shit too. But, you know, come on. Oh, you're feeling Leslie Nielsen on that flyer, right? That's a Stephen. Stephen, is that right? Age of Quarantine is a very cool interview show. Well, I'm on it on Friday, brother. Oh, Lori Dawn. Okay, cool. All right, good. That said... Um, oh, I got to shout out Rebecca Gray in, in the Poconos in Pennsylvania. Uh, Mac Gray's wife, uh, the drummer for Antidote, yo, shouting out Rebecca Gray. She's a big fan of Expedition Unknown and of my brother's work. So got to shout her out. Uh, what else? Um, A7 Comp, April 27th. Any questions? There's a super chat um, if you want to make a contribution and, and, and ask a question. But it's question time. If you have a question for my brother, Please uh, post it up. Let's get down. Let's bring, uh, let me clear the deck. What the heck? And we'll bring Evan B. Stone back on. You know the story about with the, with the Evan B. Stone name, right? Didn't, didn't, we, go, didn't we go over this once? Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> Evan's going, no, no, no. All right, we won't get into it. People know it, though. Dude. People know the story. Yeah. But we don't need to get into it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, from Pauly Pork Chops. Evan, did you ever go into an episode as a total skeptic about something? And when you came out of the episode, you were a believer. Yes, uh, 100%. I did, uh, I did this show called Finding Bigfoot on Animal Planet. And I did season one in the pilot. And on the pilot, we went to this uh, Prince Williams Island in, Af in uh, Alaska. And it was, um, it's an island. And uh, it's one of the only places I think is um, old growth forest. It's really remote. And uh, I was with this guy, Bobo, <laughs> if, he, if you know the show that you know, and he does this thing where he, he, he knocks and then he goes, Oh, <laughs> and I'm, I was just, again, a kid from New York. I was just like, I love this. Like, we're Bigfoot. Let's go, you know? Uh, and, uh, and I play into it. Cause that's what they, you know, I, I got to, you get into it, right? Because their process of what they do is really the show. And then from way in the distance, I heard, ah, and I was like, I was like, what was that? He goes, that was Bigfoot. And I was like, well, I know no one's over there because I know everything about this island. Like it's, and uh, and then we started finding these hair, like up the sticks up top, you know, had a certain, like they were going through it and there was these nests. And then you know, we found an actual big footprint and I was like, hey, wait, 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 you know, what's going on here? You know, and uh, so I was pretty much sold after that. I have my own version of what Bigfoot is. Um, and personally, I think uh, Bigfoot is a fourth dimensional creature that comes in when nature is pure. So like, um, let's say even like old myths, uh, fairies, things like that. And any culture has their version of what they see because it's magical thing comes and they don't, they don't have no basis. So they, they, they think about what they think it is kind of like a Star Trek episode <laughs> in essence. But uh, that's me um, because they would find them already. Right. So, and they're not, they can't hide that good. And there's more than one, right. There's all has to be like 200 or something to be a, a real thing. Um, so I do believe in Bigfoot. Didn't we go through this whole thing you and me once about Bigfoot or like alien pets? Alien pets. That that's a thing. They're too. like the grays. They're like pets of the grays. 
Yeah, some people think that. Um, I think, you know, I, also I think aliens aren't aliens. They're always here. They're in another dimension. They kind of come in and out. Um, that's why they're not in cities. You see them in, in nature because nature has a real energy to it. it. The mana coming from the earth. And considering, you know, some people think that, you know, we're paving the earth right now and we're, we're squelching that mana. And, you know, I think some people think it's done on purpose, you know, to cause the magic of the earth and what it can give us like the American Indians, you know, believed in. Um, is just out the window, and uh, we believe in the almighty dollar now, you know. So, hmm. okay, don't get too heavy. Oh, on. yeah, how about that? Um, I know this one. All right, so Chucky Brown says, mm -hmm. Chucky Brown, our, our resident historian, singer mm -hmm. of Crazy Eddie, who happened to be on the A7 back to the New York Hardcore Chronicles uh, <laughs> uh, comp coming out April 27th on Pitchfork. Uh, on Destination Truth, you went out to the oldest part of the Great Wall in mm -hmm. China. They did a story on the ghosts of the Great Wall of China. Can yep. you speak on what you caught on camera? Yep, yep, yep. Uh, that was really the most dilapidated part of the, of, it was really cool. And supposedly, you know, when they built it, um, they, you know, people died and they just bury them in, in the wall, you know? And you could see the quarries as you go down the wall. And they just, it's incredible. And th that was the first time that I ever seen Josh he doesn't really believe in ghosts that much, but um, he's not like a believer. And I was filming him and his I saw his backpack. He was just get pushed a certain way. And he goes, what? He looks back behind him and he looks at me. And I was like, and I was like, oh, it was uh, it was it was creepy, man. It was really <laughs> creepy. Um, so he got he got pushed and I believe it. He doesn't mess around with he doesn't claim that ever. And he sees a ghost or anything. It's not like that for him. Um, he's real good like that. So that was really wild, you know. Um, okay. Again, you know, there, there's a lot of. It always happens with me because I'm really open to receiving things, and um, so usually when I'm on a ghost show, things happen. I was on Ghost Nation uh, recently, and um, my the 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 guy. Um, uh, Haas, the, the, the main lead, it says, oh, I, I feel something. And then right when he said that, my camera blinked out. And then afterwards, I said, hey, man, just want to let you know, my camera blinked out at the same time. We should rewind it and see what happened. You never know. So they got me on camera, and it turns out there was 30 seconds missing. A, a loop, a, a time, like, was missing out of my time code, which just doesn't happen. It was like a camera. It doesn't just stop and go. And it was like, Oh, it's like, where is that 30 seconds? What happened? You know, full Twilight Zone. It's Here's um, Debo to Pro, New York Hardcore yeah. Comics. What's the most haunted place you visited? Ooh, well, um, I'd have to say it was this, pl uh, it was, again, with Ghost Nation, I was in a, it was a prison, an old prison uh, that used to be for in the depression to put, they bring kids there, you know, and then before that it was a, a tuberculosis thing, you know, it's like this place is blah. And it was, I was up on top floor. I mean, it was like, it was all over the place. It was like, I saw a shadow like come up the wall and over. So like, it was like shadow, it was shadow figures. Okay. And then I heard, music up on the top floor and I was doing B-roll and I go around and I'm like, hello, can you turn off the B-roll? And I look over and it was no one. And it was music as clear as you hear, like it's like <laughs> old school. And I was like, ah, oh, and that same episode, check this out. We did something called a call and response where we say, um, we usually know someone's name, who something happened and we try to call out to them say, hey, John, you know, we heard you got killed here and we, we know you're here. So just say something. And Give us a sign. And underneath, this is like drop dead crazy stuff. Underneath the boards we were, we heard boom, boom. And I felt it in my feet, right? And we're like on a floor, like no one's underneath us. And then we said, knock twice, yes, sir. Once, no. And sure enough, we asked some questions, boom, 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 boom. It was like, it wasn't, it was crazy. Even the hosts of the show, were freaking how, out and i was about, wow how about that place that you told me about that ranch 
that's like that where the, like the most right. normal activity happens. Yeah. Like, where, Skin, where, where, where is it? Skinner's? What is it called? Skinwalker Ranch. Well, I, I did the show Skinwalker Ranch on History Channel, and uh, that is a place that it has anomalies in it. Like um, I had a compass that was just spinning. I mean, how does that work, right? Uh, we dug up some really weird 50s sci-fi type of thing. Uh, the government was doing testing there, um, so these things were buried. Um, the place is cursed, you know. Uh, Skinwalker is a is a zom is like a zombie character that the American Indians cursed the land with, um, and it is so haunted that no one's allowed on it. You get to the front gate, there's people with guns, and you can't just show up there. I mean, it is really nuts. Um, unex I mean, unexplained so many so many times. Um, also a good place to see if you want to see aliens, uh, or lights in the sky. We did a piece in Atacana desert in Chile, the most remote part. And man, you look up in the sky and it's just like, I mean, a lot of them are satellites, but if you look hard enough, there's some that are not, and that's crazy. Yeah. Okay. Here's, here's, um, let me change my banner to the New York hardcore banner. Yes. Any sir. memories from the early nineties music video shoots, shades of gray, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Somebody asked, I got a couple pictures. So let me, let me, let me, let me put up a couple <laughs> pictures here because, you know, first off there's, there's this. Now you were one of the cinematographers. I was, I was the, I was a cinematographer on that one. Yeah. So, here we are shooting shades of gray at there's rap bones. There's uh, rap bones on top. Now that's, I think that that's Paris Mayhew with the steady cam rig. Uh -huh. Then you can see me sort of in the middle of the stage. I'm, I'm up with my shirt off with, with a, and, and with a, with a camera to my eye, but this is biohazard shades of gray. And we shot this at the Academy, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was and, nuts. Yeah, yeah, it was um, Paris Mayhew was directing, and uh, it was one of the only times that I got to DP one of you guys' videos. You guys were doing your own thing, and I was doing my own thing, but we collaborated on this one. And and Paris says it's his best video he's ever done. You know, so I, I think it was hardcore. It was like gritty and grimy, and um, it had all everything you need. That's right. That's that's that, what a nineties that's what a nineties filmmaker looks like. By the way, um, there he is, Bobby, Bobby Hamble. Hamble. Yep. That's right. And um, it was chaos. I mean, Biohazard back then was on top of their game. For and sure. um, we we shot at that venue and it was just like, again, I was just kind of like, yeah, I'll shoot a video for you. And then it was just like, raw chaos. People look like they're fighting, you know, people get getting hit. And I was like, ah, what is it? But I loved it. You know, the energy was great. And uh, the video turned out really good. Um, here's here's a photo. I don't think this has ever been seen before. This is from deep in my archive. This here is, this is, you see, uh, if yeah. you look to the right, this is special effects man, Drew Geritano, showing yeah. us how to use the flamethrower. Yeah. That's, he's talking, that's, that you could see me, I'm facing the camera, Bobby's next to me, Evan with hair, and then Billy with his back to the camera. Now this this remember this, this 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 was awesome, man. This was in the fireman training center on Randall's Island. Yep. We there was like a they, they had a subway car there, and what they what the firemen used it for is to do rescue out of there. Yeah. And the subway car was like out of the late seventies. It had all late seventies graffiti in it. It was like a time capsule, and th and that's where we shot you know the the performance stuff. Uh, 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 of shades of gray, right? And and the, 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 the uh, wasn't wasn't OSHA approved? I'm sure that the flamethrower. <laughs> dude, it was like wait, I got a picture of me. He has, he has. I think he made it from a pipe and some. Yeah, uh, no, he made it. You know, here I am with it right here. Here I am with the flamethrower, mm -hmm. right? Taking oh, a yeah. spin on the flamethrower, like Wah! Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, you know we. We're out there doing it, scrappy, scrappy filmmakers making videos. And, you know, it's like that now. I think the video budgets are the same, really low now. <laughs> so you got to be crafty, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But that video, you know, I've, I've done a lot to it. And, and that one really, really is awesome. And yeah. uh, Paris Mayhew did a great job with it. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he did, we did a lot of great work together. Paris really was a, a, a great director, man. He did a lot of great stuff, man. Yes. You know? 
Here is talking about talking about um, vi music videos. Here is you and I on the set. We did the video for we did "Sucking Me Dry" for my energy mm. channel zero from Belgium. That's right. Um, this is look at that phone I have in my hand. That's the OG. I got an OG wow. phone in my hand. There. This is yeah. 1995, I think. Yeah, this is the LA. Um LA River, right? Aqueduct, LA River. Yeah, that's where they shot Greece, you know, where the cars are yeah. racing. And uh, it's it was a tunnel to get to where we are, and it, we had to get it cleaned out. It was just fucking nasty. And, um, it was nasty. you know, run and gun, like no permits, like still doing it, you know. Truth be told, I'm no, doing No, we got a permit for that. We did. We did, we did, I, don't yeah. think we, I, I don't think you could. I don't think you could. Yeah, yeah. I don't think so, but here's for the actual uh, shooting. You're on the dolly there. This is inside that tunnel, which is yeah. like an access tunnel to the LA, to the LA, is it called the LA Aqueduct or the LA yeah. River? I, I think so, LA Aqueduct. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's my trusty Claire NPR. You know, I'm Amen. still I'm still doing it. Um, you still have that camera? No, I have a, no. I traded in for another uh, paperweight called an Ari, Ari yeah. FR1 with high speed. Um, but, um, Hey man, you know, I tell you what, um, my iPhone 12 pro max is my new filming camera and it looks amazing. And I am doing a lot with it. Um, not professionally with shows, but my own stuff, um, and developing shows. So any all out there that thinks that equipment is what you need. Don't think of it. It's all about story, 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 personalities. Um, you can shoot it on toilet paper. If it looks, it, who cares? It's, it's story driven. Um, here's the, nice. here's the, here's the, here's the early Stone Brothers. Uh, you could see me with the cowboy hat. Um, you know, you there's that camera again, right? That's the yeah, well, that's yeah. A, now this is a band called Solus Rex. Um, that's Rod. Um, uh, I can't. Not, not, no, that's um, I can't remember his name. I'm drawing a blank on the bass player. Played with Neil Young and for many years with um, uh, Rocket uh, Rick Derringer, Charlie Torres. That's nice. Charlie Torres on bass. And Rod, they also played with Buddy Miles. They were friends of ours from from like you know the Antidote, Return to Burn, when we were doing the rock thing, and and we did this video for them. Now, what's interesting about this is this is in Long Island City, and at the time it was a total wasteland. And now it's like where Uncle Richie lives now. Now it's like a park, but this is one of those parts in New York where we go do a music video, yep. and at the time it was a friggin' wasteland. It's like where I did the White Trash video, kind of right yeah. close by, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Lenny got it. Gantry hey, what Park, was, Gantry what was Park, our, Long Island City. What was our motto? We wouldn't shoot there unless it smells like like feces, and yeah. blood stains, and, and it's full of crap and garbage. That's that's how we roll. You know, it has to be we, like we, it has to stink. It, we go out a location, and and all these places we would shoot music videos back then. It would be like you know you you know these funky places. There'd be like crap in the corner, and it would oh, yeah. stink like whiz. And we'd be like, yeah, this is the place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this, is, this is the place. Um, here's, um, hey, what's going on with this right here, bro? What is up with this dude? Boom. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, uh, I, this in, dude, bro. In the early 2000s, I started doing directing MTV shows. Uh, and this was for, uh, I'm with Busey on Comedy Central. And, uh, this dude was my boy. He loved me, but hated producers. He was like full, like, like split, like, like, a like the, the like a half bad, good guy. You know, he's like, Evan, you're good. Cause I was his director. He wanted to be good, but then he was a real piece of work. Uh, <laughs> He was like a spiritual shaman and then and then a wacko doodle and then he would be like straight up and say great stuff and then the woo. Right. But I'm with Busey is really funny. Is he's great. I tell you another one I did. I back in the day I directed the um Andy Dick show. Uh, oh, and that's on MTV. That. And Andy Dick was the funniest dude you know. Um and I he liked me because I was like Jackie Joke Man. I'd just be laughing. Every time he'd come he'd come out as Daphne Aguilera, like the twisted sister or whatever and just all fuck buckled and i uh, just look at him and laugh and he's like okay i'm good because you know com com comedians they have such egos uh, oh my god and he was a nut job but i loved him i loved him for it andy dick man he yeah he, he's good funny here's here's one that funny you guy. this ties in with the show the guest we had on the last show kurt vanderhoof was the guitar player in this band right this, this is metal, yeah, metal church metal yeah. church right 
Yeah, we shot this at the Limelight, which was an old church, actually, yeah, and right. Uh, right. smoked it up, backlit it. You mm -hmm. know, it was so epic. You know, and this dude is like, he's kind of like Meatloaf. He's like, has this amazing voice and he's just thick, you know. He, he, passed, he passed away. Okay. Um, David Wayne, I think, David, that's David Wayne, the singer. Uh, he was the original singer in uh, Metal Church. And he went on to sing in the band Reverend. That's right. Or this was Reverend. I think one of those. I did. Yeah, I did two of those. I went and saw you. I, I, you did Metal Church and you did Reverend, right? I did. I did. I did. Yeah. Yeah. So. I that, know. Yeah. That, that, I had that long hair, man. That was my, it was like a, I was like, that was my power, my power source. <sighs> yeah. Well, here's, here's where we were both, we were both, uh, we were both growing it in here. Oh, there yeah. Yeah. I like the shirt, like ultimate, ultimate nightmare frisbee, it's, right? Frizz, ultimate frisbee. I was, a, I was a captain of my ultimate frisbee team, the Baldwin Burnouts. We never won a game. We'd play like, uh, like uh, Brooklyn Tech or Bronx Science, and there'd be like forty-two beat break, and they would all go, and the dude would just throw it into the end zone. Dude would be all empty. I'd be, be thrown, <laughs> we're, we're man on man, you know. We can. They playing. Their B team would just kill us. We never won a game. Uh, well, we. We never won a game. Nope. And uh, but we got schooled a lot. We got schooled. What was the name of your team? The Baldwin Burnouts or something? Yeah, the Wizards. There you go. That's that's got to be ninety six. Because look at the piercing in my neck. I, I have don't that. Know. I don't think I had hair in ninety six like that. I think it was okay. Ninety four. Maybe a three, something like that. No, yeah. that, look at the piercing in my throat. Yeah, bro. that's as if I had hair right there. Zayas. They call me yeah. Zayas. Planet yeah. of the Apes, you know the the orangutan. Yep. yep. Let me uh, let me see if I just don't want to miss anything. Okay. What what? Okay. Here's another one. We're young here, man. This is a young one, man. This is a, we're like going through a family album for the world here. Here, this is a cool one. What? <laughs> oh yeah, Yorma Kalkinen shirt. Well, I know yeah. where this was. We were we were going to see Yorma Kalkinen play from Hot Tuna. I love that. You can tell by the year by the Paisley shirt I'm wearing, you know, like yeah, right? 80s, 80s. And we were both growing our hair out at this point. Yeah. You know? uh, that's the thing to do. Hey, Rap Bones, wait a oh. second. Hey, Rap Bones, what's up? You leaving? Yeah, I was just going to bounce, but I'll say hi to your bro, man. I'm enjoying the show. But yeah, I got to run to the bank and do a couple things. It's running a little long. Go ahead. Yoda. I got to say, man, I was on point with you today, Evan. We had the, I mean, were you a big uh, Indiana Jones fan? You that's know? Kind of favorite Story. movie in the whole world is. is the, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's my, that's my man for sure. That's and you know what? The inside poster, the alien, the xenomorph. Yeah, that's right. And you were yeah. talking about Conan Savage Sword, right? Before, that's that's yeah. what I lived on. I lived, that was my jam right there. Uh, yeah. So. Um, I love that stuff too. Is anything by Edgar Rice Burroughs or Robert E. Howard or uh -huh. all, of all that, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, you know, I really did like Mandalorian a lot. I really did. Yeah. Uh, I enjoy it. I'm, I'm a geek, you know, I enjoy yeah. all that backstory stuff, you know? Hey, life is a story, right? Yeah. It could be a big uh, fish story or you can tell it, you know, the way it is. <laughs> you can live um, right, yeah, on. Yeah, you guys, what a great show today. Uh, the work you do is amazing, both of you guys, you know. And, uh, whoa, the, the, I was getting the creeps when you were telling the ghost stories, you know. It was like. Oh, I got so many. Yeah, you, I got you so feel many. The, you could see the truth in your eyes. Like, yeah. yeah. There, was, there was one time I, we worked with a clairvoyant, and um, they looked at me and said, uh, and they busted something on me that is very deep, and someone passed away in my life. And they, the person just looked at me and said, you. And it was like, told me everything. And I was just like, Ugh. I was like, out of everyone, he pointed me out and said, this is what that person's telling me. It's kind of like, um, yeah. So it, it yeah. kind of always comes to me because I think I'm open for it and I accept it. But I don't want it. Like, I, I get rid of it. I don't want to go to no take doubt. over. No doubt. The good hey, spirit. Man, the veil of reality and spirituality is very thin. Yeah. Think about it. <laughs> You know? The Holy Ghost. I mean, uh, it's been in the, ch the Bible forever, right? So, all right, Rap Bones. I'll we'll see you, brother. See you guys later, man. We'll see you uh, in a week from next Wednesday. I'll see you guys. Okay. No show next Wednesday, right? Cheers. No show next Wednesday. No. All right. All right, all right man. We'll see you. Guys later. Peace out. Yay. Yeah, yeah.
Hey, what's this one that, that low more Tell us about Petra. What's Petra? Oh yeah, wow! Well, I, I got the best story about Petra. Wait, wait, is that this? Hold on. Is that mm -hmm. this? Hold on, hold on, hold on. No, it's it's a city carved out of the out of. Out of uh, that's Death. not this, right? No, that's Chernobyl. And those boats in the background all listing like that, they're in the harbor, all fucking radiated. And that harbor must be just, just, blah, still, <laughs> still, still. The harbor I mean, of Chernobyl? Look at the boats. boats. They're all listing. and just the whole They place. left the boats in there? Left everything. Just left it. We got to go. We got to go. But uh, Petra is, um, is in Jordan. It's the... It's the um, during the Silk Road times, it was a major stop for water. Um, and uh, they got, believe it or not, they had the water locked down because when it rained, it, their whole world was the way the water runs down to their cisterns. Anyhow, they built these, they built this city that looked like Rome, right? The outside, but the inside um, <laughs> are just caves. <laughs> and I have a great story about. Petra. I got kicked out of Jordan. We all did because of me. Um, and we weren't allowed back for, I don't know, 10 years because of what I did. And um, so we got there and we we're looking for something called a djinn. And a djinn is a ghost, a genie, right? And they believe in this thing wholeheartedly. And they said, we're going to do a piece on the gym, but don't tell anyone, you know, tell them we're doing something else, right? So I have a pretty big mouth and sometimes I don't think and all night they had this guy following us to all the caves. It was a night, it was a full moon, and we're just bugging out, man, bugging out. And we get down to this treasure, treasury, they called it. It was the main building. And inside we're doing a straight up seance, like like with candles and a beep, 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 little device and like all this ghost busting stuff. And the guy kept looking because again, this is serious business if you're looking for a gin. So he goes, what are you doing? And I was filming and like an idiot, I said, we're looking for a gin, sir. And he goes, I knew it. Everybody out and and give me the tapes. And, and I was all <laughs> tapes fucking went behind me like old school skate style. Oh, that, that old thing. Like, hey, yeah. this is, these are not the droids you're looking right. for. Right. It was like, but it took a while. Like, <laughs> you know, I was like, <laughs> out. Everyone started doing, and then we could, sent it away, and we we said, we gotta go. And I was, and fucking, I remember Josh looked at me in his eye. He was like, boo. And I was like, I ruined the whole shoot, and we, we got to get out of there. And then, um, why? What was, I don't say, what was the big, because we we're looking for a gin. And we're okay. actually doing the worst thing possible, conjuring oh, it up. Oh, I got it. We're yeah. like seance, like come to us. Oh, right. candles are like the worst thing that they could ever think to happen. Right. And right. we were doing it. And he's like, what are you doing? I said, we're looking for a gym. And I was like, uh-oh. And then we eventually had to do the last scene like outside the bus. Like, you know, we had to fake it to get it, to get it done. But oh my God, that was, and, and now it's a story. <laughs> And I'm still working with Josh. And yeah, right. It's pretty uh, funny. This one's a little out of focus, but man, you remember this stuff? Oh, uh, thanks. Oh, yeah, the Glamis. Glamis Desert, bro. Oof, don't go there. You could die. <laughs> it's a, it's like a sand, uh, it's a doom dude, buggy. We went, we went when Glamis was going off, dude. Thanksgiving when, when weekend, yeah. Thanksgiving weekend, people would go out there. It was like Burning Man times 10. People yep. would like put wheels on couches and like, to like it was the glamorous. They had to shut it down because people were getting killed, you know? Oh, yeah. They had something called a witch's tit there. It's like a bump wow. that you think it's another bump, but it goes down like 200 feet. So you're like, brah, brah, brah. Yeah, that's it. Vin <laughs> yeah, Vinny Doak got it. It's it, glamorous or they're sand dudes outside LA. Yeah. But it's, it's a couple down, hours, yeah. right? Yeah, near the Mexican border. Man, it is nutty there. And uh, that was fun. Uh -huh. I Yo, I was out there one Thanksgiving. It was bananas. It was like it was like Mardi Gras, New Year's Eve, and Burning yeah. Man all in once. People were wasted, and yeah. everybody's driving, and they're driving these ATVs, and people like it was it was dangerous, yeah. and yeah. but a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, we saw a bunch of people getting life flighted out. It was yeah, it was right, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, yeah. That's, and like, uh, check out our style here in the desert. I'm wearing the the powder blue Adidas uh, uh, um, sweatpants, the Got Wheelies shirt. We, you got to wear goggles, right? Oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah. It, it's nuts, but it's, it's also hard filming that stuff. You know, you got to still make it look great. It's all sandy and, and crazy. And um, now you use a drone It'd be nice. Here's one for all you, all you skateboarders out there. How about the stone brothers and Steve Caballero? What? Yeah. Oh yeah. He's yep. legend, right? I bet you he's still doing it. I bet he's doing that, that McTwist thing he does still, you yep. know? You know. Uh, our friend Brian Bowden says, talk about getting thrown in the Hua Baku forest. What is yeah, that? That's the, that's the one, Hey Brian, that's the one, um, that in Romania that I got blown back and I had those scars on my arm. Oh, we did that already. We okay. did that already, but I could talk a little bit more, you know, this, this forest was magical in a, in a bad way. It had real bad vibes to it. And, uh, and I got blown back. Um, I was sitting in there. I got blown back. I, lost consciousness for 20 minutes and got permanent scars on my arm from it. Drew had them. Brian, if you missed it, there's an exclusive photo of, of my arm getting jacked is jacked up at the time. Um, and I was pretty scared, real scared. Um, it was like, and I think after that, I started to really kind of have more of that stuff coming at me. Cause I think it was, I was all of a sudden open for it. Um, and, uh, it was it was wild, you know. Um, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know how that happened. Uh, I mean, sure, maybe I was running through the woods. It got caught up, or I don't know. I just don't remember. But they're pretty deep. Um, the one, the the major one, there's two or three that are still with me today. Uh, as a reminder, um, that I got accosted by something um, unexplained. Um, but you know, when you deal with ghosts in your mind and brain in your brain, things can go crazy. You know, that's what that's what I do know is that if it, if it has to do with feelings and and ghosts and what you see, uh, it's all that's when they come. You know, because maybe only you see it. Um, hey, um, how about this guy? I went through. I got through all the pictures. How about this guy, bro? Oh yeah, <laughs> he's one of our one of our mentors. Uh, he owns a stage in New York, and uh, yeah, this is this is yeah, this is so. Gabe Dirienzo. He owned Three G Stage um, on the Upper West Side in New York. I was the stage manager on Three G Stage. Uh, you know, my dad used to shoot on the stage. I was the stage manager. Uh, he's still around. Uh, he's a big part of of. Uh, we shot Biohazard uh, Punishment in there. Uh, we shot typo negative black number one in there, you know, oh, yeah. and, and when I was the stage manager there, we did suicidal tendencies, give me your money. And we did, um, what's his name? Uh, big daddy Kane. We did shoop, yeah. shoop, salt and pepper, but we love him. That's Gabe DiRienzo. He's, he's a classic. He's a Queens guy, right? I no, mean, no, he's from Brooklyn. Yonkers. Yonkers. He gets kicked off of Facebook like every two days. Yep. God bless yeah. Him. Yeah, every couple of days they kick him off Facebook. Yeah, yeah. God bless him. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, do now uh, we're heading down the home stretch here. Do we want to talk? You want to tell the Billy Idol story? Yeah, I got a Billy Idol. I got a couple of rock, real classic rock stories. And I was doing. Uh, I used to work for EPK, uh, uh, um, uh, Chrysalis, SBK, and EMI. It was a EMI Records group, and I was at. And I do all the electronic press kits. So I, a new album would come out and I'd go interview them and cut in the music and their photos. And um, anyhow, I went to go do Billy Idol on his cyberpunk album in 93, maybe 92, something like that. And uh, <laughs> now this, this is this is uh, earlier. This is earlier, but I'm just giving right, you the right. Billy so, Idol, giving you the Billy Idol visual. So he was doing it with who is the the electric acid Kool-Aid test guys, like Ken Kesey or one of these guys. No, no, Ken Kesey, no, Tom Wolf. No, no, he had to, they had this system with the audio goes 360 and it's in just speakers and they, I don't know, they had some thing going on. And uh, I went to interview Billy Idol at a, at a studio and, um, and and Billy's manager's like, all right, so, you know, just like interview him and then afterwards, you know, whatever. So I was all nervous, right? I was like, Billy Idol. And so, Billy comes in and he sits down and he's just like not into it. Like, where's the mic? And just totally not into it. And I was like, man, I had this, this, I had this clipboard and I had to, I had to make the list, right? It's my job, right? I ask these questions. And I didn't know how to interview people back in the day, really. Now I do. And um, finally, I was like, yeah, I guess we got it. So he stands up really. Oh, quickly. here we go. Hey, hey uh, 
Timothy Leary worked on Cyberpunk. That's that right. comes from our friend uh, uh, and, and uh, who's becoming our, our second uh, hard, uh, historian, Chris Corkum, our old friend from the Boston hardcore scene. Yeah, Timothy so, Leary. It's so yeah. what are we into, right? I think Timothy Leary is a guy like right before he died, they dosed him, right? With some yeah, yeah, yeah. Timothy Leary was the dude, like tune in, drop out. He was the dude that was yeah. like, but like, so, like right everything. when he died, it was like three, two, one. Here, have a big dose of LSD. Like, damn. Anyhow, so Billy Idol, I was interviewing. Him, he finally gets up, and then he falls back. His head hits the the concrete. Bra bra bra. And all of a sudden, I, I rush at him. I'm a little too late, and I pick up his head. And, and I'm like, I got Billy Idol's head in my hands. And then his manager comes over. Billy's on amino acids right now. Everyone out. And I like gave the head to him and I walked out. And I was like, oh my God. And I was expecting him to like be dead. You know, I, I killed Billy Idol somehow. Oh man. Billy Idol's on amino acids. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, vitamins. Billy's and Billy's I was suffering from exhaustion. Like, yeah, you know who I think Billy Ma I was manager was at the time is Bill LaCoin, who who managed Kiss. Was I he think English? Because I remember he's like Billy's on amino acid. I was like, what? I was like, okay. I was like, take the head. And I had him his head in my hands. You know, it's fucked up. <laughs> I don't. Want and, you, that. and you did, you did, um, you did Wilson Phillips too, right? Yeah, I did. We did. Uh, we did all the Wilson Phillips. Uh, we did um, um, Wilson Phillips. We did John Sakata. We did uh, Vanilla Ice. We've done. No, Yo, you and me did a Vanilla Ice video. That's right. We 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 did. Uh, so it was a cool time in in the nineties. And Stone when, Brothers did a Vanilla Ice video. That's right. Uh, Return of the Ice Man. No, yeah, no, it was. Um, Return of the Ice Man. Ice Man. He had the dreads. It's when he had the dreads and he was yeah, trying yeah. to like smoke yeah. a lot of weed He's and cool. be gangster. He's cool. He was cool. Oh, yo, uh, yo, let me tell you, oh, yeah, you know what? Let me tell you something about Vanilla Ice. Nice guy. Oh, yeah. Good guy. Yeah, he was yeah. a nice guy. Yeah. Remember we went, what was he doing? He was racing. Was he racing motorcycles or did we go see him jet skiing? We went jet skis. Jet skis. We went and met with him beforehand. We went to like some jet race or something. Yeah, well, now he's big time into flipping shows on home, uh, on uh, I, got nothing, I can't say, ever say anything bad about Vanilla Ice. Yep. He was yep. really kind to us. Yep, yep. Yeah. Oh, I you know back in the, in the days in the early '90s when I worked with music videos, we'd we'd do an uh, online sessions like when we finished means drugs uh, in 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 the online room, smoking weed, doing coke, you know, like and for some reason, like oh, we're going to online session, oh, making some calls and like it was like <laughs> right, it was like weird, but like that was the way it was back in the day when you finish a a, a music video, everyone. Comes well, I don't, don't want to mention it. I don't want to mention any names, but <laughs> back back in the when I was the stage manager at Riverview Studio, you know, you'd have you'd have some of these when when the, the golden age of music videos. I remember when I was the stage manager, a crew came in at seven in the morning, right? A a, a, a notorious like director, a, a young guy, and, we, and I don't want to mention his name. Yes. It's not, it, it, you know. So I go to because because you have to you have I had to hit the bull switch to turn the power on. I go open up the door to, to the to the electrical closet to to hit the bull switch and like his like gaffers in there on a crack pipe. I was like, ah! I yeah, was like, crack. you can't do that in here. Right. Like, these, these dudes showed up at the shoot at seven in the morning, still fucking like partied out from the night before. Oof, he's probably dead now. <laughs> uh, you know, crack what was really- the name of the Vanilla Ice video we did? Was it uh, The Wrath? The Wrath. Yeah. It was called The Wrath. And it's very hard to see now. It's very hard video to find. Um, it was because I think he was on SBK and they had the big record with him and contractually they had to do a second record and do like two videos. Right, so they right. sort of like gave him the money to do the record, did the two videos and then dropped them. And I yeah. think we did like the second video, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Hey. Um, tell me, tell me truth. Tell me Drew and Evan, have you, have ever the two of working together had a challenging moment like where your techniques or ideas clashed <laughs> all the time. <laughs> it's, like, it's like iron sharpens iron. It's like, oh. it's like, oh, it's sharp. You know, it's like that's pretty funny, bro. Yeah, no, it, we're doing a new film together and we're friggin' arguing about it all yeah. the time. Uh, it's 
it's tough being with your brother and being creative be, and then cause other things. And your dad are, too. My dad. Yep. And uh, with the mentorship of the Yoda Arnie stone, but yeah, we're getting through it and it's all making us grow uh, better. Um, cause we both do different things and yeah. we have to respect each other, but you know, your brothers. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you sort of what it is. It, 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 is that you see the background that Evan comes from uh, at this point, He's he he does a lot of these shows, works with Josh a lot, and that is what he does very well. And I come from a different background. I, I don't think in those terms. I'm I'm an ind I do like independent films. I'm like a I'm like a, a rambling gambling kind of independent filmmaker, brother can you spare a dime kind of guy. So it's two different worlds. And then you got my dad, who's basically old school. You know, my dad's super old school and the three of us are trying to yeah. make everything work here. And yeah, it can, it yeah. can be, it can be a little, um, little yeah. Stressful. Yeah. You almost want to say, fuck it. I don't want to do it anymore. And then you're like, oh, mm, dude, you know, you can't, hold can't on. That. Yeah, so, no, it's good. I, I tell you what I've learned in the last one of 10 years working on discovery channel is it's all about story. It's all about, you don't do anything unless it moves the story forward. Um, yeah. and, um, and that helps. And also, why are you doing this? So why are you going to this person? What information are you going to get from it? Where is it going to take you? Um, and these things are just storytelling stuff, um, that that's really important, uh, especially to like discovery channel, uh, the expedition unknown. We're trying to find a treasure. Uh, we're never going to find it. No one, what are you going to, one day you're going to find treasure, but we're finding, uh, it's all a history lesson, finding clues to bring us to that time period so then we can go into a package you know like oak island bro like how do they do 10 seasons of oak island because yeah. they always they don't stay at oak island they go places they do yeah, packages yeah. you know it's a history lesson uh i think that's why everyone loves expedition unknown it's because you take these iconic stories and then we actually go and we go look for them and then yeah. we we have some cash to throw around so we start getting some good people and some good places to go um and then all of a sudden magic happens then we stay there and we actually do it and we try to do it and sure enough and josh is great he's great and he's taught me yeah he's taught now i'm now we don't even we're the kind of crew that doesn't talk much when we're on set we just do it you know yeah and it's fun and it's hard to get there that's why he keeps us around <laughs> yeah right yeah a absolutely yeah. um all right well hey uh two and a half hours in uh, do you want to shout anybody out? Uh, thank anybody on the way out the door here. Yeah, Arnie Stone. Arnie Stone is the the one that gives us all the 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 wise words, and and, and it's why we're here. Um, and um, his creative and my uncle Dick Stone um, has taught me to edit, and all of us. Uh, and uh, you know what? He's my father and Arnie. Yeah, we got. Shout, I didn't. We didn't shout out Uncle Richie. Got a shout out Uncle Richie. Uncle Richie. Talk about our mentors, Uncle yep. Richie Stonecutters. That's right. Absolutely. All right. Everyone, everyone in our family is in the business from way back. And uh, but nothing was given to us. You know, we're just in the business, but it's up to us to be the, like Drew doing this show. I mean, like no one's telling him Dick is doing it and uh, everything we're doing. So, you know, say to everyone out there, you know, do you know you want to be a filmmaker? Yeah, do it. Just do it. Just go in story, you know, pick a good subject. Um Yep. And make sure it has a point, you know, uh, I don't know. And, and you can instant message me if you have any questions about cameras or anything like that. Like mentor, I mentor a lot of people. They come through the business through me. Um, a good position to do in the film business right now is called a DIT, digital technician. It's not an assistant cameraman. They deal with all the cards and stuff and they are on our shows. And that's a great way to start in the business. Um, so for y'all computer guys out there who want to get into business, it's a good one to do. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, man. Well, and, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll. I'd like to also shout out my girlfriend, Julie, uh, who's my rock and uh, and is just there for me at the hardest time. So. OK, cool. Um, that said, um, thanks for being on the show. And let's get this freaking film done, dude. Let's do it right now. <laughs> I'm on the ones and twos. <laughs> Come on. I don't want to hear dad calling me being like, when are yep. you going to start working on it? Come yep. on. Yep. And we're also looking for new stories, guys out there. You know, um, everyone has a story. We're looking for some. So anyone has some crazy story. Let's come out. Let's do this. Let's all do it. 
Maybe we do a collaborative effort with your fans. Maybe people film. We give them a we give them a, a, a mission. All right, everyone, this we're doing homeschooling. Everyone film it. You know, and then we you know, let's do something. Hey, Come just on. so you know, just so you know, Chacho's Tacos, um, <laughs> the Gutierrez brothers. Evan, if you're ever around Corpus Christi, Texas with Josh, come by Chacho's Tacos and we got you all on a hot, fresh meal. I um, mean, we, we travel yeah. America this time, so I'm down. Yo, you let me know, man. The, the Gutierrez brothers will take care of you, man. Uh, yo, Laura Zeitlin. Yo, we got to shout out Laurel Zeit, our friend Laura Zeitlin. A big, big fan, her and the kids uh, uh, of the show, you know? Yes. Um, yeah, you go. yeah. Get, you know, let's do this. Yeah, everybody. Matt Gray, thank you. The whole Gray family in the Poconos, big fan. Uh, you know, uh, Matt Gray's wife, uh, Rebecca, uh, who's a big fan of the show, when Josh did his sort of, um, what do you call that? The uh, Speaking and out, he does uh, shows, yeah. Yeah, I have, I, you gave me a clip of that. Hold on, do I have that? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, and actually, I'm, gonna start, I'm starting to do them as well. In December, I'm booked in Vegas for a for a speaking engagement at uh, Paracom, which is like paranormal. Evan B. Stone, please, Mr. Evan B. Stone. I, I just want to let everyone know that I'm in first. You know, like, think about it. There's a great quote that said, uh, Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did in the backwards and the heels. <laughs> so, you know, you know what? These guys, they, it's 24. Everything, you know, every cave, every slippery thing we go down into, they're carrying 40 pounds on their shoulders, they're doing it backwards, it's insane. So, thank you, Evan. I mean, I mean, that's my boy as, right as, there. Yeah. As an so, as a is an so, egomaniac, so, that works for me. <laughs> so as a lot of people don't, a lot of people don't realize. And Johanna says, "I'm a big fan of all your shows, and especially your bloopers." But mm -hmm. a lot, a lot of people don't realize. And what Josh says is, "You're in there first. Like yep. you're in. You got to go in first to shoot him coming in. Like he's like, oh wow." But yep. like you gotta go in first, bro. That's right. That's right. And uh, oh, I hate bugs, man. And when I feel them, <laughs> I'm not, and they get in there, I'm like, ah, I break the scene. I'm like, ah. Bugs. And then they, yeah. But uh, there's a lot of creepy stuff. A lot of slippy places around. Super slippy, like mm -hmm. real slippy. Um, yeah. But you know, as far as uh, dangerous goes, uh, just like I'm a climber, so I always assess the situation. Well, you are you as a teenager you used to go up to new paul's yep. you know with, with your crew with with uh, with mark and them and yep. you climbed the gunks up in new paul's That's that right. was your thing man you were a climber as, as i think you were a teenager when you were started to climb right yep. so all that rope work and all that stuff and, and diving in weird places and how to control of my fear um and then um you know the audience wants to see the max like let's get in that hole let's see what's in there um and it's our job to do it um and it's fun. It really is fun. <laughs> uh, let's end it on that. I love you, bro, and I'll talk to you soon. Whoa, thanks, everyone, for listening. This is a really fun show. Uh, Stone Films Earth on Instagram. What up? All right, catch you later. See ya. Well, there you have it. Well, that was kind of a special show. My brother, Evan B. Stone. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live that you have been watching. And, of course, we're sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill. The Texas Silver Rush, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, Your Core Hardcore Fan Page, Fan Page, DTFM Vinyl Distro, and in Corpus Christi, Texas, Chacho's Tacos. Thank you, everybody. I know it was a long show. Um, you know, thank you, Dominic, uh, you know, and Debo and, 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 and everybody, man. Steve Malibu, good to see you out there, man. Sally May, nice to see you. Chris Corkum, always. You know, Johanna. You know, upstate Rick, everybody, thanks for hanging in. I uh, want to remind everybody that on uh, Sunday, this Sunday, is um, Mike Gitter. And I need to read, Stephen Messina needs to redo this flyer because I think it's getting flagged. Because can you believe this is the world we live in? On the YouTube description, it says XXX, and I think they're flagging it. Because because it, it's a porn because that's a porn connotation. So 
I got to I got to redo that. Um, Mike Gitter is coming up on Sunday. There is no Wednesday show a week from today. We have uh, then we have the return of Jimmy G from Murphy's Law. There's supposed to be a Wednesday show after that. Uh, it was going to be the Coney Island uh, in Leipzig, Germany compilation, but that just got pushed back. So we'll see if we slot somebody in there. If not, the next show will be John, John, Jesse, which is from nausea. And then um, a week after that is Al Burrill from SSD control and gauge. So engage. So Anthony, uh, that was awesome. Thank you, Drew and Evan. I love both you guys and your work. Well, thank you, Anthony. Really appreciate it. Jeffrey Zukowski, brother. Great show, Drew. Yo, I could have done, we could have done a series with my brother. We could have done like, we could have real. We, we didn't even get into, me and my, we didn't even, with the show my brother, we didn't even get into the shows that I dragged him to his, when he was a kid. I dragged him to see Minor Threat and The Misfits and SSD Control and to the A7. We didn't even talk about that stuff. Um, you know, he, he, you know, we didn't even get into that. Yeah, SSD's coming up. That's right. That's right, Kano, don't you know? Um, John Jung, what's up? Good show, missed half of it, but I'll rewatch the recording. Missed the filmmaking world. Filmmaking world misses you, bro. Um, so that said, I um, want to thank everybody once again. It was a special show. Thanks for, oh, and you know, I'm not going to be able to mention this, but this Friday I am on the Age of Quarantine, um, the St. Vitus show hosted by Chris Enriquez. Uh, please check it out. Drew Stone, film director, producer, film editor, the New York Hardcore Chronicles, Antidote, NYHC, and hardcore historian. How about that? I am recognized as a hardcore historian now. I'll take it. That's very, that's very kind. Um, so there you go. Thank you, everybody. The world is opening up now. I hope you don't abandon the show. I hope we can continue on together uh, in the future. Until then, do good things, and good things will come to you.